Hello, hello, folks. Welcome back to the very earliest part of a new stream. If you're joining us in real time somehow, super early, then, uh, and you, and you happen to be in a place where it's also Friday, then, uh, happy Friday. It's Friday here. Which has less meaning, I suppose, when you just work on this stuff all the time, obsessively, but I'll still pass on the sentiment. Hello, nice to see the familiar faces. Um, I'm not on the couch right now, actually. I'm at the desk. So, um, yeah, this will be a slight diversion from the last couple of things I've been streaming. Um, I mean, I've been working on this, uh, this robotic cat camera thing for a while, if you've seen that. But I wanted to do something a little bit different today. And uh, so I did this project a little while ago that's sort of a, an SD card emulator that you can script um, in a pretty limited way. You can write code that runs on a CPU, which gets callbacks when the SD card has a block read or written. And you can kind of fabricate a new block to read or access the block that was just written. And it's, it's very slow, but um, the communication interface can run at full SD card speeds. It's just very slow at processing each block. So that was something I did a while ago, and I think we might want to revisit it very slightly. Um, <laughs> uh, a very slight detour. Uh, the web browser seems to be making art. Uh, this is a little toy I made a while ago that so for some reason I was re-remembering. Um, it's kind of fun. If you go to approximate.life, this was something I, I decided to throw up on one of those weird URLs that you compulsively register for some reason. Um, and so this is actually running kind of a simulation, which somebody asked me on Twitter very recently, like, is this running kind of full speed, or is it, uh, you know, is, it, does it, is there an artificial delay in there, or is it running as fast as it can? I think it's running as fast as it can, but it just does a lot of work. So it's got this grid of triangles here, and this sort of genetic code down here in hex, which you'll also see up here in the URL. Oh, someone else pointed out, was it Chris? Someone who's, who's around here a lot pointed out that uh, this kind of slams your browser history, which I was realizing, oh, well, actually, if there's a way to extract this, then now I have a bunch of timestamped URLs that I could use to replay a time lapse of this thing's evolution. So you might have guessed that it's sort of evolving over time a little bit, and it's making random mutations in this code by doing, you know, it's kind of fuzzing. It's doing like bit flips and substitutions and like trying different things like that. And the code actually gives you a path that you can walk along, kind of like a turtle that generates um, like a 2D grid of triangles. So you can imagine ones and zeros tell the turtle to either go forward and left or forward and right. And then you just kind of mark all the triangles that that turtle hits and fill them in and make them real <laughs> in some way. Um, in this case, making them real means making a little physics simulation of them that relaxes the, the triangles into more of an organic mesh. And that's what you're seeing here. And so it's this weird thing where small changes in this code can have fairly large changes in the result here based on how the new mesh relaxes. So you can see that the different patterns in the triangles here actually create fairly different angles and different packing densities of triangles in the resulting mesh. And then ultimately, the fitness, the fitness function that it's evaluating is it's trying to make art. And by that, I mean very literally, it's trying to make an image that looks like this image of the word art that it saved during initialization. Um, and if you're especially curious about how this works, it's actually all just in one terrible source file. Um, actually, some of this is pretty well documented. There's this like subclass, or the, this little object here that actually does the triangle grid calculation that I just described, but then some of this stuff is just really terrible JavaScript that could use some cleanup. Uh, anyway, that's why the fans may be whining slightly more than usual, because this has been making the Mac Mini warm, which is also next to the temperature sensor. So I think I might close this now so that it can cool off. Anyway, um, the other thing that I wanted to show on this computer device here um, was some context for this little SD card emulator. 
So for example, um, that's not bad. I was doing these streams a little while ago. Some of you might remember these. Uh, and these streams, I, I was trying various methods to kind of get information about the internals of this, uh, this kind of industrial programmable logic controller device. So it's something where the firmware isn't published and I was working for uh, an embedded security company at the time and we thought it would make a good research device to try to figure out how to extract the firmware for this device and then figure out how to analyze it for security and then kind of use that as an example of techniques that might generalize to other devices. Um, and so at the time I was working on that and streaming it and <laughs> it was a fun project and one of the kind of little uh, little tendrils of research that came out of that was this device that I called FlipsyFat, which is kind of a silly name for a device that emulates an SD card and a FAT file system and then rapidly flips through different file names in that file system and then uses a, ti a, siming, the, uses a timing side channel uh, to actually analyze how long the processor that's reading this directory listing takes to process each block full of file names. And it'll notice that uh, if the file name hits another you know, piece of the uh, name that it's looking for, then the comparison function will take a little bit longer to run before giving up. So you can kind of iteratively figure out what file names are interesting to the firmware that's running on some black box device. And so in this case, the firmware was actually making file name comparisons. It was like an 8.3 file name, and it was comparing it in chunks of four bytes at a time because it was using like an optimized 32-bit at a time mem copy, which meant that I had to brute force a lot of file names. It wasn't like the full 32-bit space, which would be 4 billion, but just like the usable ASCII subset of that, but that was still kind of a lot. So ended up doing a little hardware device that, uh, that helped with that. So anyway, that was fun. And you can still find those stream archives on YouTube. The, I don't think I've actually finished publishing the work for that. So it's still kind of in my editing queue. And I'd like to turn this into a full blown edited video at some point in the future. Um, but yeah, the work that came out of that is largely this Git repo. Um, scanlime slash flipsyfat. And it's, as it says here, is based on this other SD card emulator that was originally done by Google for their thing called Project Vault, which was also something where you wanted to get in between a computer and the storage via this channel that would usually be used for just a plain old SD card. So they developed an FPGA uh, design, so HDL and Verilog. Uh, for a pretty complicated system on chip actually, but part of that system on chip was an SD card emulator. And that actually, there's not that much. <laughs> the readme is not very good, is it? Um, anyway, yeah, I had to figure out what is actually useful in this code here. But there's a system on chip design Geofight, I think, is their system on chip. And then their Verilog source code, yeah. And then you can see all the different pieces here. So this WB stands for wishbone, which is the bus that connects all the different parts of the system on chip. Um, the CPU itself is open risk, which I think is in a separate source tree. Um, so you can see all these peripherals they added. So there are some crypto peripherals. This FOFS thing is actually their implementation of kind of a fake FAT file system, although they have really different design goals and theirs implements kind of these fake like read and write files that are used as like a pipe communication channel kind of thing. The SDHC is the core that we, I was actually interested in. I've got a, a true random number generator um, and then some more interconnect clock generator. So then inside here, yeah, there are some interesting layers here. So uh, I think I might have done a block diagram of this on an earlier stream, but let me see if I remember enough of this to summarize. So all this SD underscore stuff forms the SD card emulator core, as you might expect. Um, I think this SD top is the main interface we'd want to look for here. So we have a physical interface to the SD card, which you would actually wire via the FPGA's fabric to the SD card slot. 
you have this wishbone bus, which is how this whole SD card core communicates with the um, actually so there, there are a couple of different pieces here. I, I was going, there, there's one wishbone bus that communicates between this like emulator as a whole and the CPU. And so that's how, you know, if you're writing code on the CPU and then you write something to the registers or like the memory mapped IO space in the SD emulator, there's a bus port that actually connects those two things together. But then there's also, a, they use the wishbone bus, so that same standard for interconnecting modules within an FPGA or a system on chip. They use that same standard to connect the SD card emulator to another bus that just serves blocks of data to the SD card emulator. So they're actually implementing a much more complex and actually much more capable system that can serve blocks off of like a NAND flash really quickly. So there's actually kind of this multiplexer layer where you have the SD card emulator, and then it's kind of talking to an internal bus, which then has both the cache that kind of grabs data from the NAND flash, and then it also has this completely fake file system that gives you kind of the pipe files for reading and writing stuff directly to the processor in the Google Vault thing. So I think this wishbone bus is actually just this thing taking the... Uh, basically all the reads and writes that are uh, that it interprets from the SD card protocol. So this is actually implementing the SD protocol, which has a bunch of different commands. It implements a lot of the commands internally, but anything that looks like a read or write gets turned into a wishbone bus read or write, if I'm remembering this right. And that's what this port is for. So this is the main piece I was interested in. Um, yeah, this uses a block RAM as a buffer so this wishbone bus, actually, I think this wishbone bus might have access to that buffer. And then there might be a separate. There's like a manager component that shuffles data between some block RAM buffers and then this external wishbone bus. And anyway, I'm, I'm getting a little too deep into this. This has a bunch of pieces. We used some of them, not all of them. Uh, this whole NAND C layer is the trans is the NAND controller, um, error correcting codes. So it's actually doing the uh, the per block error correcting code and decoding that you add to each data block when you're packing it into the slightly larger NAND controller block. Um, FTL is flash translation layer. So anyway, the Flipsy fat is based on that, but uses a subset of it. And to simplify that whole thing so that it would be much easier to deal with in a, you know, like I didn't want to build up this whole big thing that was fast and efficient but hard to hack on. I wanted something that was like easy and quick to hack on. So I made this like very, very simple read one block, write one block, just single buffered callback based kind of thing. Hey there, Horn. So you'll see some of the same Verilog cord code these SD modules here. Uh, test bench, I think that's theirs. So this whole this whole directory is just the yeah, so all the Verilog code actually, yeah, that's right, because I wrote this whole project in a slightly higher level hardware description language um, called MyGen, M-I-G-E-N. And it's, it's like a way of writing Python code, which is the, kind of like a meta program that generates some Verilog as you run it. So you compile, you compile the design by first running the Python code and then taking the Verilog that it generates and then running that through the like Xilinx tool chain, for example. So the Verilog here is all just like a subset of the stuff that came from the Google Project Vault, which I think I did have to modify this some. I mean, I guess you can see commits here, but I did end up adding some stuff to it. Like, I don't think it supported SPI mode at all. Like the, the SD spec, um, it defines this totally separate way of talking to SD cards that's sort of uh, like two parallel buses and a clock where it has a command bus and a data bus in parallel, each with a shared clock, and then a reply bus. Um, well, it's like got like it's got like bidirectional. Yeah, that's right. 
I'm, I'm misremembering for a sec. But the both the command bus and the data bus are bidirectional, but they can switch directions at like slightly different times. Um, it's sort of like you you send a command and then it like queues the data and the data comes back separately. So it's this very kind of nice way of doing pipelined data transfers like you'd want to do for storage. So it makes sense, but it's harder to talk to with a regular microcontroller. So the SD cards also support an SPI compatible mode. But it turns out that was the one I needed, and this core didn't support it, so I had to emulate it, or I had to add it, um, add it to the emulator, um, which was kind of this other extra state machine that I had to add. So that was that went in here. Yeah, and then this stuff is actually just all Python code written in that MyGen higher level language. And this actually is pretty nice in, in, in as far, so far as how high level it is. Like this would turn into just like probably a thousand lines of Verilog. Um, this is doing things like, for example, we have this abstract object which represents the bus that we, like the wishbone standard bus that we're using to connect the CPU and all of its peripherals. Um, that module also knows how to create a wishbone standard SRAM device. So it just takes like whatever RAM primitive the FPGA device provides. So like I've just I've described FPGAs in the past as kind of this sea of like small bundles of logic gates or like small memories if you want to think about it that way that you can configure with this sea of programmable interconnect. And the uh, there's usually a way that you can take some of these elements and reconfigure them as RAMs. And then there's also a way of usually getting like these special purpose blocks that are just like dedicated RAM that are slightly larger than you would get if you just use the logic elements as RAM. And so anyway, there's all these FPGA platform specific details about how you would wire those up into a working RAM. And then there's even more details that involve wiring that up to the standard wishbone interface that you would use to connect that to any of these other peripherals. And, it's just it's just nice. Like I can what is this signal? Um, oh, that's right. Is this is this the size? I don't know. Um, I forget what these actual variables mean. But this is instantiating an SRAM primitive, if I'm remembering right. And then we just have a submodule within this that gets defined in the Verilog code that actually implements the details of that. But I think this read buffer is a wishbone port. And so I think this is, this is like how we would interface with this SRAM um, from the, uh, the underlying Verilog code. Yeah, this SD link layer thing is in another file. Anyway, um, I want to play with this code, and I should mention the reason we're here is, well, I mean, partly it's just kind of nice to nice to do some FPGA stuff and nice to do some stuff that isn't just completely assembling mechanical stuff and gluing bolts into slots. Um, but I've also been working on. It's funny because like it's it's like a it's a talk for an upcoming conference at B sides in Portland, and it's actually one of the keynote talks, and so. Being a keynote, it seems like the thing that I'm aiming for is actually much more about like slightly bigger ideas and more like kind of inspirational kind of stuff rather than just like here is a project that I did. But I still want to kind of tie it into some concrete projects and this seems like it might make a good demo, especially if we can just kind of like do something slightly new with it. And, and some of this was inspiration from uh, Kate Temkin, who's also in chat. Um, and, and she actually recommended that I, I use this uh, uh, this is a, a little tiny thermal camera. It's the TG165. And so we might actually try to see if we can get it to working with this. Um, she's actually done some hacking on this device too, um, which you can see on GitHub here. Tools for hacking the FLIR TG165. And this actually seems pretty awesome. I've not actually tried this on my FLIR yet, but I think this might be fun too. Uh, it's kind of on my to-do list to try making a firmware plugin for this. So if you read through this, you'll see that what she's done is basically just reverse engineer enough of the firmware and the bootloader and all that situation in order to make an alternate bootloader that lets you uh, safely replace uh, kind of your own application into the otherwise unused portions of Flash in this thermal camera, which just runs an STM32 microcontroller. 
So that seems super useful and I want like an overhead view thermal camera for Tuco Flyer and so I think I'm going to be using this for that. So I haven't started this yet but I think what I'm going to do is you know find some convenient way to bolt networking onto this. Uh, you know maybe I find some GPIOs and I add an ethernet adapter. Uh, maybe I do something through USB or through the, uh, the SD card slot but get this on the network somehow so that I can you know, insert it into the stream. <laughs> oh, oh, that's cool. Okay, Temkin has an offer of, of some firmware inside inside specs. That sounds fun. Yeah, that might come in handy. I mean, I don't I don't have like. It's probably going to be a little while before I, I get to the point where that's immediately useful. But I I will I'll definitely like stash that for later. That sounds sounds fun. Um. So yeah, one thing actually that. <laughs> If you, if you look through this, it's all very exciting. There's all this SD card emulation going on. There's all these different commands that come down. And, and like I said, the SD bus is like these, it has several different modes. It has this SD mode versus the SPI mode, where SPI mode has a single serial wire going one way, a single serial wire going the other, going the other way, and they trade off between doing command and data, kind of like you'd expect from SPI, whereas the SPI D mode actually has a dedicated data and a dedicated command wire, but they're each bidirectional, which kind of throws another monkey wrench in it. And then there's also a four bit mode where you can actually, instead of just using a one bit data bus, you can switch it into high gear and use four bits. Um, theoretically, this supports all of those, but it's all prototype code, so who knows if it actually works. Um, Oh, and that's interesting. K. Temkin says that it definitely reads some alternate file names other than upgrade.bin if they're present. So yeah, the previous thing I did with this was using, um, if you missed the part where I mentioned this earlier in the stream, I, I have a program running on this little system on chip with an SD card emulator on the FPGA. And the program emulates a fat file system with a bunch of different slightly modified file names, kind of brute forcing part of the file name, just like you could do it one byte at a time if you're comparing one byte at a time, but in this case it's comparing one 32-bit word at a time. So I'm brute forcing all of the ASCII combinations present in one 32-bit word of the file name. But that doesn't take that long. It took a couple days in this case. And well, actually I think it would have taken a couple days. I think I actually found the file name that I needed much faster. Like I think it only actually needed to run for a couple hours. Um, but yeah, the, uh, that actually just worked by running a program on this general purpose CPU that's also on the FPGA. Um, so the same code that you're writing these callbacks for. Um, I can actually, I can show and not tell here. So, okay, we were in this cores directory looking at hardware and this is like a definition in Python of all the hardware registers and how they're wired basically. But there's also just some plain old like code, some C code, you know, for CPUs, those things. Uh, and that's, that's how I actually implement the experiments that run on this. So the one that was actually, yeah, the actual experiment here was word list. And so this works by using the main loop effectively as a list of things to guess. In this case, I just have a bunch of nested for loops that create repeating patterns of all the 32-bit ASCII combinations I was interested in. And then this is just running on a, a tiny CPU. It's an LM32 with a lattice core. Uh, and it's just, it's just any CPU that's like small and has GCC bindings will work really. This is just the one that was already easy to use with this particular system on chip setup. And so then inside that guest file name function, we have the actual substance of this thing. Yeah, so here we're actually, for each of those different guesses, we're kind of constructing this fat directory entry specific to that guess and kind of putting it in a queue. And the code is sort of a little inside out because we're actually using the control flow to direct how we fill this queue full of file names. And then when the queue fills up, we kind of dump it by kind of blocking that whole, like it's almost like a little tiny thread switch we do, except there is no actual context switching going on. We kind of put that aside and then work on this other task, which happens to be uh, waiting for the device to slurp that block out and then replacing it with a new block. 
Oh, thank you. So yeah, this will be fun. And this was a fun little experiment, but this software is also set up so that we can do other things with it relatively easily. So what was this? This was something that, <laughs> this is something that just lets you hex edit the blocks that it's reading off of the SD card, which is pretty low level, but was kind of interesting for some side channel analysis. This lets you edit a file. Um, so anyway, that, that could be interesting. One problem I was having already is just, we might have to take a little detour to look at the signal integrity on this, uh, on this setup. So, oh, we got a hi from were and ever. I don't know how to segment the name or how to pronounce it, but uh, hi, nice to see a new face. Oh, let me make sure I'm catching up on all the chats here. Oh, we got some kind words in the YouTube chat from uh, Justin Bowl and Dallas Epperson. Oh, that's awesome, thank you. Oh yeah, and uh, mention of, um, yeah, Gareth in Twitch chat mentions the uh, um, Alvaro and Jen's Unnamed Reverse Engineering podcast, um, which is also pretty great. Uh, yeah, the link, I should, I should put a link, I should plug that because they're great. Um, Gareth already put a link in the Twitch chat, but. It's probably faster to go there than to type it in again. <gasps> oh no, don't advertise. I forgot I was gonna do that. Okay. <laughs> I'll just put my finger somewhere on the keyboard. Yeah, here it is, the Unnamed Reverse Engineering Podcast. This one is fun. Um, yeah, Jen and Alvaro are great. And yeah, I just listened to, to these recently and, and they're pretty awesome. Um, on a similar vein, uh, I think somebody might have already mentioned this, but uh, Embedded.fm is also pretty great. <clears throat> I, I've been a guest on Embedded.fm in the past, and so I've met Alicia in person, and she's as awesome as you would expect from listening to a podcast. So, uh, yeah, two awesome things if you're interested in reverse engineering and embedded systems and stuff like that. Oh yeah, a little wiki to collect extra links would be nice. Also, somebody in the last stream suggested an FAQ, but we were struggling to come up with actual concrete questions, so maybe a wiki would collect stuff like that too. I don't know if anybody has a preferred wiki platform to use, but um, I guess we could put it on GitHub, but I don't know if like, I mean, we already kind of use Git logins a lot for the, like any code development stuff and for Gitter, but it's not necessarily a great thing to force people to grab. So if there's like a wiki that maybe has better login options, then we could use that too. <laughs> uh, Munarofi, I think, on YouTube asks, how many chats are they? Uh, well, as far as I know, there are three chats. There's the kind of official Gitter chat that you can see embedded on the stream at gitter.im slash scanlam slash live. And then both YouTube and Twitch, where I'm streaming, have their own built-in chat systems. And I try to monitor those too, but they're not actually embedded yet. I think. Uh, it looked like we might have some uh, work in progress on a bot to kind of mirror some of the chats into the Gitter chat, which could be nice. Uh, but so far, that does not exist quite yet. <laughs> Dylan is lamenting having another interesting podcast when already so far behind. Um, I think that's the view we want. We would have cat camera, but I think Tuco and Luna are both upstairs. Let's get box cat. Behind bars is a little bit sad, but maybe it's better than no cat at all. 
Poor guy. It's good, it's good he's resting. He is recovering from some major leg surgery, and so on doctor's orders, he is gradually getting back to full levels of activity, but we don't want him like jumping and playing too much on his leg while he's healing from a major fracture. So... <laughs> Aw, Emily's asking if the Twitch chat is awful. Actually, the chat's been mostly really good. I mean, I've been really surprised with how awesome the community is so far. I mean, it seems like you're all a wonderful bunch of pretty nice and curious people, and I've been really happy to uh, facilitate folks connecting both during and between the streams. So, anyway. Let's see, I've got a desk full of random SD card junk. Maybe maybe we'll go back to making this camera big for a sec. So this is the thermal camera I was just mentioning. And it's got an SD card slot way up at the top on this boot. Do we want to be servo AF here? Aw. Adler Oliveira says, first time watching and it's already amazing. Well, that's great. I'm glad you made it don't have a regular streaming schedule at this point. They're kind of opportunistic. It's like when we're both in the right place at the right time, it can happen. And it's always nice when that lines up. <laughs> Apparently have a marriage proposal in YouTube chat, but I, I don't actually accept them via that medium. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, normally this is just used for saving images from the camera. You can also load it load firmware that way, which is uh, how K. Temkin's uh, firmware alternative loader ecosystem thing starting point ends up working. It's kind of slow at booting, but the basic idea is it has one of those inexpensive FLIR lepton sensors, which are in all the cheap IR cameras, basically. Um, they're pretty low res. and it's basically like the FLIR ones that you attach to a phone, except instead of your phone, this has a built-in microcontroller thing. Oh, nice. Another good uh, mention from Garrett. Uh, Gareth, uh, twitch.tv slash noobcat. That one's new to me. I'll have to check that one out. <laughs> That's the Raspberry Pi. Anyway, so, uh, well, I guess, I guess I should show you just for reference how this thing is supposed to behave. Um, it's also possible it's slightly non-spec compliant in some way with SD cards because I, I have had trouble with it just not working with random SD cards. And so this is the card that it came with. You can see the FLIR logo. Um, so I'll stick that in. We should be able to see it on the screen and save pictures. So the SD card icon shows up. You might notice if you're actually looking at that, like I do sometimes, that it takes a sec to show up. And so there's some procedure it's running to initialize the card, presumably. If you see the difference between the click and when the icon shows up. So that's the first clue that the SD card has initialized successfully. And then you can take a photo, save it, and then it gives you a check mark there. If, come on camera. If you take out the SD card, then so I'm just, it's just leave it, leaving it hanging in there. Then you can take a photo and choose to save it, but then it's like, nope. Um, if you take a photo and then put in the SD card, give it a second just in case. Oh, I guess I waited too long. What if I don't give it a second? I'm just curious if it pulls the SD card for insertion right after you save an image. So um, take a photo. That worked. So I pressed in the card, waited just like less than a second, and then pressed OK, and it saved. So OK, that's like one kind of test we could do. There's also the firmware loader. So I already actually have an update binary on here. It's just the standard vanilla one from the FLIR website. And so we can actually run the firmware update process here, too. And I can just show you what it normally looks like and get a recording of that. If I can servo AF here. Oh yeah, Gitter has this really stupid misfeature where, I mean, they do a lot of really giant embeds when you post URLs, which can sometimes be okay and sometimes be annoying, but they actually autoplay Twitch if the stream is live, which we've had trouble with like the audio getting recursive here. Um, 
So yeah, we have to we have to take those out if they happen, unfortunately. And it's nothing personal. It's just like working around a bug in Twitch, or in uh, Gitter, basically. So for this, you hold down the bottom button. Most if you haven't come across this, like most devices that have firmware updates and at least one button. There's some combination of doing something with the button at power up that you can use to force it to go into the bootloader. And so in this case, that's holding down the, the bottom arrow here and then holding down power, which is how you usually start it up. And then you can see this fun little thing, which definitely looks like some programmers wrote it and didn't have to incorporate any images. But and then you can like, you know, it looks like a bootloader. You can, you can, I've, I've got the Nintendo DS into some similar states where it uh, just gives me some hex numbers on the screen like this. Anyway, and then you reboot. One thing we might do for the embeds is like, I mean, right now the, the Gitter overlay on the stream is just a web browser, but one project that would be kind of nice is to do like a slightly more custom interface for that so that we can change the presentation of some things. Um, the main issue there is that you just, like it takes a lot of work to just re-implement all the functionality you get for free with a web embed on Gitter because it can just do a lot of formatting and embeds and stuff for better or for worse, which sometimes you want. Oh, that's a nice warning. Uh, K Temkin says if if the TS TG165 hard locks, then it doesn't really turn off. So it's nice to be able to yank the battery. That's a good suggestion. We might do that soon. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still there's still a little bit of question as as to how much of this. I mean, I'm I'm kind of playing around here. I'm kind of planning for a future project with the TG165. I'm kind of planning for a demo as in an upcoming talk. So it's still a little bit speculative, and I don't know how deep to get into any one piece of that right now, but anything I can do that has a lot of overlap is definitely worth doing. Oh, and then maybe I just answered the question that Dallas Epperson just look, just asked, but um, yeah, part of part of what the flare is for is, I mean, I, I have, I've had this thing as just like a tool in my shop for a while. It's been a little bit superseded by having a FLIR 1 donated uh, so I can use that uh, with my phone and stream it a little more easily. But since this is now something that is both useful and a little bit spare and apparently pretty easily hackable, my plan for this is to actually use this as an overhead camera for Tuco Flyer. And that might be, there are a lot of different ways I could do that. I mean, I wouldn't even have to modify the firmware necessarily. I could have a separate micro that just taps into the bus between the sensor and the micro and then streams that over Wi-Fi. But ideally it wouldn't require a lot of hardware modification and ideally it would use ethernet. So you can imagine various ways that could happen, like very, various hardware hacks or just a firmware hack that uses a USB ethernet adapter maybe. Um, or a firmware hack that uses a Raspberry Pi and Ethernet. So, oh, and yeah, if you haven't come across just like what this device is, it's this thing specifically is kind of a cross between a, like a heat vision, like thermal camera, and an infrared thermometer. So it's not calibrated with a temperature at every single pixel like a higher end thermal camera would be, but it gives you like a single fairly calibrated temperature using this big thermal camera, or IR thermometer. And then it also has a lower resolution, or you know, higher resolution than the single pixel, but kind of low resolution thermal camera that lets you see the actual shapes. So we can actually get a better picture if I bring out the, I've got this thing also, which is an add-on for the iPhone. Let me see if I can just, since we're on this topic, I might as well bring this up for comparison. I just have to take my phone out of its case. Out to be you. No more phone case. Phone cases are great, except that you can't actually use any accessories when they're on. Um, I'm just remembering which menu this ended up in. This is the one I just want a command line, so I just end up searching for the app.
So this is just, it's got a lightning connector at the bottom. It's got its own battery. I think it can charge the phone, but I think the battery is mostly to run itself. It's also got a manual shutter. So you have to pull this down in order to recalibrate the sensor. Whereas this one has a built-in electromechanical shutter. What is this doing? This is not showing the thermal camera. This is just showing, let me try to get this on the screen here. Screen mirroring. Come on. Screen mirroring and do not disturb mode. And All right, so that's what I'm seeing. Um, why is this just a camera? It's not supposed to be just a camera. Something does not seem right here. <laughs> That's not relevant. No, I can I can do a whole bunch of irrelevant things. Oh right. They wanted a name. Well, we can see how well this is going. Replug that maybe. When this works, it's actually really nice. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I missed who did that, but I guess somebody just posted the, the sensor this is based on. So you can just buy that as like an individual. They're just, they're also pricey. Like it doesn't make thermal cameras suddenly cheap or anything. It just means you can make one without all of their stuff around it. Okay. It's still looking like a regular camera instead of a thermal camera. <sighs> I was just like trying to blow the lens off or the dust off the lens. Sorry if it looked like I was trying to kiss the lens. Um... Settings is going to a web browser, which is not what I want. And then doing any of that loses the connection with the camera. Great. Pull and hold the shutter for a while, okay. Oh. So it looked like for a second it had some like edge detection data or something, but. I'm just like rebooting it. This thing at the back is like kind of the shutter control and the on off switch. This is really failing right now, and I don't know why. Selfie mode. What? So wait, where is this coming from? This is coming from the little visible light camera in the back of the unit. Yeah, they upgraded the software recently, like within the last year, and made it way worse. And I think the hardware isn't compatible with the old software anymore. Maybe this is the one that I hack, because the other one is actually quite useful as a device and it doesn't actually keep needing <laughs> all this babysitting to use. Um, so the reason it has a visible camera is that it's trying to do this clever thing where it uses both a visible light camera. Um, you can bring that here. 
It has both a visible light camera and a long wave IR camera, and it tries to fuse them together in a clever way using kind of edges from the visible light and lower frequency stuff from the IR. So you can kind of see where stuff is, but I guess it's just not working right now. Okay. Yeah, upgraded. Anyway, maybe this is something to take apart then, if it's gonna be this annoying. You know, maybe we just like take the lepton sensor out of it and use that on its own. Anyway, but maybe I can use this one and actually just point the camera at it. So in fact, yeah, here is the camera we were just using. You can see the warm spot that my phone left against the back of it. There's my thumb. So like it's pretty low res, but it's still actually kind of nice. Yeah, Piotr says if you take the lepton out of that uh, guy, I assume he's talking about this this iPhone thing, then I could use that as part of my streaming setup. Yeah, that maybe that is what I do. Maybe that is where this is going. Because <laughs> this this has been kind of an annoying device, you know. Um, if it was USB, then maybe I could use it from something that isn't their iPhone app. Um, there was an iOS app, like a third party app or two that was supposed to be compatible with this, but I don't think they still are. Clear. Search App Store for other FLIR stuff. <laughs> or figure out at least the USB interface. Yeah, I mean, is, is USB even what it's, what's going on here? Um, I assume it probably is, but... Oh, and my phone has a low battery too, that's great. So we have FLIR 1, we have FLIR Cloud, FLIR Tools, great. What is FLIR Tools? An intuitive iPhone and iPad app for FLIR cameras. Somebody says it's better than the FLIR 1 app. Let's see if it is. I think this one's also made by FLIR. Oh, interesting. Kate Temkin says it's not supposed to be supported on this model of iPhone anyways. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, was it only for like the iPhone 4? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna need to plug my phone into batteries soon too, but let's see if this works. What if I don't want to click the import button? You can connect it to all sorts of cloud stuff. Is it possible this is related to battery state? I don't know about this. Instruments? Oh, import from instruments. Searching for FLIR cameras. Oh, this is looking for something fancy on Wi-Fi. Maybe it's better than the FLIR 1 app for stuff that is not what we're doing. Okay, this is annoying. Let's do something else. Um... Is that something else just going to be taking this apart? Because, like, honestly, if it doesn't work, why am I keeping it in one piece? How do you get this apart? I'm guessing that this piece comes... It's like this is a sticker or a thin plastic piece on top. 
Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna put this aside for a sec, but maybe this is a yak we shave soon. Huh, Peter's tearing, enchanting to tear it down, tear it down, tear it down. Well, um, yeah, that does seem compelling, doesn't it? You can see through this crack a little bit, or is that a reflection? This is so far off topic. I'm just so bad at this thing. Last time I tried it, it actually worked. Like, it was annoying to use, but it did end up working. Like, what is going on? I don't remember where I put the flare up. Oh, I can follow K. Temkin's scars. <laughs> oh, and LED on the back. It is green right now. And blinking. <laughs> news? Who is giving me news? Okay, I'm holding the lever again. <laughs> that was unrelated. That dude with the tips and tricks, I don't know if he's going to help us. And now we're back to just the visible light camera. <laughs> what does the Flare News say? I didn't want to let it finish loading. Okay, let's reopen the app now. So if I reopen the app, it goes to this home screen and the camera doesn't even connect. And then I go up here, and I tap the hamburger, because for some reason that's a thing we're still doing. And it's like, no, there's no camera. Is the box at the bottom left this thing? I don't know what box at the bottom left you're talking about. Sorry, I missed the context. <laughs> um, I just noticed a comment from ArcAIN6. Seems like almost a chemical formula, but maybe not. Uh, it says, one of these days you should reverse engineer one of these cheap Banggood or Shmibe LVDS boards so I can have a schematic to make my own. <laughs> I feel like that's one of those things, I mean, I don't know exactly what you mean by LVDS board, but you could probably find that as like an example schematic in a data sheet for the part that you end up wanting to use. Flick down, I mean, that's what I've been doing is like opening the app and then ever since uh, Kay Temkin said to just hold this down, that's been how I'm getting it to respond, but then that doesn't wake up the thermal camera, just the visible light camera. Oh, and then Michael says try changing palettes. Yeah, I oh, let me try that again. I tried a little bit of that, but... Maybe I missed something. MSX distance. Oh, that's interesting. This has got to be a software problem because these are the images, right, from the lepton? It's just not overlaying them. Yeah, K. Temkin says, what happens if you capture a photo? I think we're on the same page. Let's find something with an actual heat signature. That's my, let me go to the actual, sorry. Uh, so this is the Raspberry Pi on my desk. Yeah. So, that one maybe, and then, did that work? <laughs> Apparently my finger was in front of the visible light lens. Oh, that's kind of nice that it has permissions for that outside the app, presumably. Well, sure. What? 
Did I just need to like open some UI and then close some UI? This has got to be an iOS 11 bug or something like that. Okay. Well, this is more like what it's supposed to do now that I can finally show you. It looks a little off because the at close range that oh maybe it's actually just in need of calibration too, but it it also doesn't quite line up perfectly, especially at close range because they're two separate camera lenses. Jay Dryden says, don't you just need to select a palette? I tried that. I was, I had been tapping those palettes the last couple times I had it open and that didn't do it. And this time I, I tried the same thing. I tapped the palette, that didn't work. And then I opened that other menu and then after exiting that other menu, that's when it started working. The menu related to trying to delete a photo and then not deleting the photo. So no, I didn't, I didn't give it any permissions or at least I clicked don't allow. So I was just exiting that UI. And I think it was just that the process of exiting that UI caused something else to refresh, like it maybe reallocated a texture or something. Anyway, is there something that really lines up badly, doesn't it? Is there some new calibration? Oh, maybe that's what MSX distance helps me do. So is this, oh yeah, this is how I line it up. Oh, okay, cool. So something like the Raspberry Pi, maybe? Okay, so that probably, oh, and I have mirroring mode on. Okay, no mirroring mode. Oh, that's so much less confusing. Apparently selfie mode just mirrors it. Great. So, <laughs> which I, and it's hard to tell when on and when that's on and off because it's just like two different shades of gray. Um, and that just literally just slides the two side to side. Okay. It is finally working. And can I just take a video now? Can I do landscape? Uh, not really. Can I record in landscape? I have no idea if this is actually recording in landscape or not. Can I view that? I have no idea if this is actually recording in landscape or not. Yeah. All right. Oh yeah, that uh, that's an RPI case I printed off of Thingiverse. It was a nice design that someone else made. Okay. Well. That was a nice little detour, don't you think? <laughs> it's okay if you don't. I won't take it personally. Uh, the plan here, um, well, I mean, like I said, this stream is a little bit more exploratory and a little bit less plan oriented. But um, one thing I did notice about this SD card slot is I was having trouble getting it to work with some of this other stuff in the system. So. Let's see if I can replicate that problem just with one of these extenders. So these are, excuse me, these are devices you can get from Amazon or eBay or any of the usual online electronic sources. They are designed to just stick in an SD card reader or into a mobile device uh, in a micro SD slot. And then you mount this somewhere more accessible. So like you have a portable something rather that takes SD cards in your car and you want like to plug cards in it from your dashboard, you know, this is what you buy. Um, they are kind of useful for this sort of thing because you can have like one development board that's emulating the SD card and have it be like a little bit distance away from the thing you're emulating. It is a long enough wire that it's not necessarily great for your signal integrity. And so I'm gonna try this, but I think it might already have problems. Um, if we get past this, then the next thing I would try is this contraption where I've got the logic analyzer connected to this um, little SD card breakout thing. And this wire actually might not be because I'm good. I found out that some of my wire is not copper and I might want to test this, but it's what I have right now. <laughs> Pass me the SD cord. I want to choose the music. Yeah, pretty much. So, that goes in there. Let's 
So I think we just put everything in, in the right orientation. Oops, I could lose these quite easily. All right, let's just go for the firmware update right away. It's probably gonna give me an error, but. Oh no, maybe not. All right, it's actually working. Hopefully it writes correctly. <laughs> this would be a great time for a bit error, wouldn't it? Okay, well maybe, maybe we made it past the first hurdle. Oh, that's a good question from Dallas Epperson who asks, like, what's the deal with the signal integrity? Is it crosstalk or degradation due to the distance? It's going to be some of each. Um, it's just this, these, these signals can be like 40 megahertz, I think, even without any of the kind of more modern high speed modes for SD cards. And that's just kind of a lot to put over this long distance with just single ended 3.3 volt signaling which is what these are using. So it's not differential or anything. It doesn't have any built-in features that you would use to send signals over long distances. So it's a little bit iffy that whether it actually works. So anyway, let's see if we can save. We got this indicator up here. Take a boring image and save it. Take a slightly less boring image of the Raspberry and save it. These are the tiniest files that it saves, by the way, and it's like a two gig card. Okay, so that's hurdle one. Let's see if I can hook this up to the logic analyzer then. I've also got a few different breakouts here to try, because I've had different, I mean, you know, I haven't found one that's like really good, so I've been trying to kind of figure out which one has the least annoying limitations. This is the worst one. <laughs> this is an old SparkFun product. I don't think they sell these anymore, but it was an SD card to full size SD card breakout that just has a circuit board with some not really good plating, some really, really, really not really good plating on the end. Uh, sorry about the wobbly cam. It takes a sec to stabilize. Yeah, and then a place to tap into the signals which is nice, and then a full-size socket. So this part of it's fine, it's just that they, these do not make good contact. They really need some better plating, and this was just like the worst, like bare copper or something that just oxidized immediately. And the other problem is this board is actually too thin. So this might have been better for like a micro SD card, but for a full-size SD card, like maybe they just got the sizes backwards and they used the board for the micro SD card because this is way too thin to make good contact in a full size SD card slot. So I would have to shim it when I tried using this one, but I don't really try to use it anymore. It's not worth it. Um, then I had a couple of these that I think came from somewhere on Amazon. I forget who, it looks like they've got a brand on the board actually. Let's take a look at that. <laughs> quarter ounce copper cloud, yeah, quite possibly. Yeah, it seemed like they used even thinner than normal copper for those edge connectors, so it was not good at all. So this is the one that I was using last time. I, I got, you know, at last time I was working on this project. And actually, I, I kind of slightly panicked, and I was like, oh man, I think I might have... I don't think I have this anymore. I think I might have sent this back to uh, to the employer along with the board that I was using it on. It wasn't actually theirs; it was like mine. But I think I accidentally might have sent it back. But then I, I found I found these in you know I was like cleaning up my lab and I found these along with some other cables. So I have this one, which is just like pristine, and so it's from Psycho Systems. Yeah, I think I found these on Amazon, um, and they seem to be all right. I, I was using this other one with my FPGA rig and then putting in just a full size SD to micro adapter so I could use micro cards in it still. And the way this is set up, you can use it as kind of a sniffer to interpose on the signal, or you can plug this into an FPGA also and just use it to, in, to emulate the SD card entirely. So I wanted a way of kind of checking out my wiring to make sure that I like to basically have something where I could make minimal changes to unplug the FPGA and plug in a working SD card and then test the whole rest of the system to make sure that that was actually working. 
So these seem all right. I'll probably keep using this one for the moment. Um, and so anyway, when I thought that I lost these, I went on Amazon again and I was like, oh, what can I get quickly? Because uh, I want to experiment with this again. And I found that SparkFun has this one, which I think is what Kate Temkin was just saying, that it has a similar problem as the larger SparkFun board. Um, I've tried using this one as just a pass-through, and it seems all right so far, but I haven't done a lot with it so far. And it sounds like Kate Temkin has already run into some of the limitations with this board. But it's a similar idea. It's a thin circuit board. This one seems to have gold plating at least. It's a thin board, sticks in a micro SD slot, and then brings out all the connectors here. Anani X, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm butchering your username. Um, oh, Anon Nexus, is that right? Uh, suggests Bus Pirate. Do they have like a circuit board for this, or you just mean like using that as a, an electrical tool? Um, because like SD is actually kind of difficult. It's like wide and high speed, which is why I had to do this on an FPGA. Like if you just want to talk to an SD card, you can do that from an Arduino, whatever. And there are a lot of different protocols you can choose from. You can just use an SPI port. It's not hard. But if you want to pretend to be an SD card, now you're kind of on the hook for supporting any part of the spec that the reader device chooses to use, which is usually bigger than what you actually care to deal with. Anyway, I'm going to put this one aside for a sec and see if I can use this thing that's already rigged up. So here, I've got, this is the FPGA I was using. It's the Papilio Pro from Gadget Factory. It's just a nice little Spartan 6 breakout board that you can get for under 100 bucks these days. And there are faster and bigger FPGAs out there, but this one has some nice software support. And yeah, so I already wired this up. I'm, I'm leaving the FPGA unplugged for the moment and I just have these wires connected. So any signal integrity problem is going to be just due to the kind of transmission line stub that I'm adding with this wiring setup. So with that in mind, let's see how bad this is. Let's put this aside also. Stick the FLIR branded micro SD card in there. Stick that in here. Ready to, ready to view properly. I just want to zoom in and uh, get the scope on the screen. All right. <laughs> Just checking the YouTube comments, and there's the lol at hello fuck. Yes, uh, I, I just didn't have a lot of patience for the forum when they were asking me for personal information to use this piece of hardware that was already in my possession. Um, all right, so there's the logic analyzer on the scope. We can turn off some of these channels. Um, which ones are we actually using? I think we are only using zero through six and five here. Let's just turn those off. Um, I think I want to use segmented memory for this so we can capture, like, probably several things are going to happen when we turn this on. It'd be nice to save separate traces for each of those. Um, can we do 10 segments? <laughs> All right, and then we need to do something triggered for this, though, so... Uh, yeah, maybe let's set up triggering before we worry about the segmented memory. So, okay, I'm not going to worry about capturing the boot up behavior yet. We can reboot it later. Let's just get some access 
Let's see if it works. So you can also see it just like starts a clock signal and then keeps it going. Okay, and it failed to initialize the SD card. The icon isn't up there. So something is now failing just because we've got this extra stuff connected. So this clock signal is only 400 kilohertz right now. So that might be like an idle clock. Like the card is powered on for some reason still. I don't know why it would still be powered on but it's not doing anything useful, so it uses a slow clock speed. Let's see if we can get a closer view of the startup behavior, though. So I'm just gonna trigger on D4, because I, I just wanna see what happens when the clock is starting up, um, and then and not worry about segmented memory yet. So D4, and I want normal mode. that near the beginning of the window there. Okay. I could unplug it and plug it back in to get it to detect the card hot plug, but I don't really feel like moving around the setup as much. Okay, so I just want to get the first trace. So I'm gonna put this in single mode, I think. Oh. So I didn't even hold it down, but I just started pressing it and these changed state. Um, so I'm gonna press single again. Let's see if that's repeatable. Yes. So I think just as a hack to get past this, because I don't care about the state change, I'm gonna press single right, just like manually after this trace so that I can get yet another trace. But it, it might be time to use segmented memory real soon, which would let us capture several things at once. So let's just do this iteratively a little. There we go. So this is what we're seeing for the first, you know, how much is that? Like a couple milliseconds after, after it starts the clock. Is that still 400 kilohertz then? Huh. I would have expected it to be faster, but all right. And it looks like we might be in SPI mode. Although maybe not actually, because if we were running the clock continuously, that doesn't seem like it would usually happen in SPI mode. Um, and I think, yeah, maybe this is SD mode. And I think these are just a bunch of, like a spam of repeated, like reset or initialization commands. But it looks like we have some glitches here, which is not terrible, but maybe not good. Uh, I mean, if we are looking at a signal integrity issue, which it seems like we are, then let's break out an analog channel. Um, mm. All right. Oh, there is actually, oh, why do I, I think I accidentally pushed the button. There, sorry about that. There is actually one test we can, no, not the ads. <laughs> There's one test we can do to narrow this down slightly before, um, like to just bisect this problem to like cut it in half. I can unplug the, um, the SD card breakout unit from the oscilloscope, but not from the little wire pigtail and just see how that changes the behavior. So these wires go to the oscope. Um, I can just unplug this whole block of wires from here. They're all taped together, so it'll be easier to get them back in. Now, this is still in place. I haven't touched it. Let's just power cycle that. Uh, 
Now it's all the SD card. So it is something about the extra load from the logic analyzer that's affecting this. Uh, okay. Turn this back off. I wonder if it's worth replacing this wire. I, I am suspicious this wire is not copper because I think it was from a batch of really cheap stuff that I later discovered was even worse than I had assumed. Oh no, see that? That's terrible. Isn't that just, doesn't that just make you want to, uh, just, just no, ugh, ugh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that would cause this problem, but it's certainly not good. So, uh, yeah, look, we, we can do better than this. Oh, I just, geez. Does anybody have a good source for wiring harnesses like this that are not expensive, but are also made of actual copper? Cause yeah, I could use some. Oh, maybe this is just something else I sh should order from Adafruit cause they have good stuff. <laughs> DIY. Yeah, I mean, well, I'll probably just end up soldering wires to these. Um, I don't have the right crimping tool to make these little box ends myself. But maybe I should get one because that could be super useful. <laughs> At least it's not aluminum. Yeah. <sighs> these are going right into the trash. Mm. Fine. So, I mean, I can solder wire onto these. The issue is, um, I guess I just want like a female header on the other end. Maybe I'll just solder wire, wires from those male headers to another female header. cable. I have some of these little IDC ends that you can use to make small ribbon cables. Um, which is not optimal because I would rather something single in line for this. That's what I've got on the other end. So that would be one option is to make a ribbon cable. not as many sockets. I have a bunch of these six by two sockets I could use for P mods on FPGAs. Um, here's a dual row socket. Here's some machined pin sockets, but I don't know if these will fit the big old square pins that I have. I must, oh. Maybe I'm just running low on these. I think this is what I was looking for, something like this. 
I think actually this is exact, exactly what I want. This is eight. I can use six for signals, leave two spare, and then ground I might have to have separate. I really want just like a single position thing that is actually sturdy. That would be really nice. Maybe I just use something like this, just a big old boxy thing. Um, it's just that the way I designed this connector, I've got eight data signals here, and then I've got power and ground up here, so I don't have a single... And that kind of mirrors the way... Like, if you look down here, it's kind of split, like there's data, and then there's power. But I could, I guess, just use... I mean, I could make something that plugs directly into the FPGA board. It's just then I don't have also an easy place to connect the FPGA. <laughs> and Nexus says, break off the edge of a dip socket. Dip sockets are terrible. Let's, okay, do we need to have like a little connector comparison corner here? Are these, are these copper? I need to keep a magnet handy for this. Oh, these might be copper. Okay, if I have some of these that aren't terrible, maybe I sh I'll use those. I think these are at least really thin wire, but thin copper is better than iron. Anyway, I was trying to illustrate what was in here. I might need the microscope. Okay, so you might notice, if you look really closely at one of these, that it's made of a stamped piece of metal, kind of U-shaped, and if you look in the end, you should see it uh, kind of forming these little spring contacts on multiple sides. And the extent to which it actually does this will vary a bit depending on how good the connector is, but you should see these little spring wipers that kind of enclose the box shape of the header there. So these sockets are actually made to fit the rectangular shape of the header pin, which is important in this case. Um, and so the thing that I'm talking about using is pretty similar. If you look in there, you can kind of see, in fact, this one I think is better. You can see those little plated wipers on the sides that slide along the box part as it goes in there. So for example, Focus down in there more. Yeah, so you can see it's kind of fork shaped with two little levers that scrape across the side of each box header. So they're actually kind of delicate in there, which is why you need the box to protect them. And then, so those just run against like these surfaces. So compare that to an IC socket. Actually, we can compare that to several IC sockets. So here is a typical IC socket. It has a little U-shaped bend there, which um, just kind of forms like one spring and then one kind of stationary, only very slightly part, or slightly springy part. These are only designed to take flat contacts, not square pins. So putting a header into one of these would just damage the socket and make terrible contact. But putting a, something very flat, like an IC leg in here, is what they're designed for. And then you'll also see these have, well, okay, this has a similar deal. This is a much boxier looking IC socket, um, already a little bit damaged. 
but if you can actually focus inside, you see, again, instead of wipers along this, the wide sides of the box, you see wipers that are kind of expecting something really flat to go in there. This one's already really damaged, actually. Like, I tried shoving something big in there, like resistor leads. Younger me would stick, like, resistor leads in IC sockets, and it would just do terrible things like this. That's probably how this happened. Ugh. Um, if you look at a fancy zip socket, they're going to have a similar property where they're really expecting to close around something that... Oh, actually, no, that's, that's not true. These actually seem like they would handle a pretty wide variety of things because these jaws close in opposite of the direction of where the chips are flat. So they're already going to be kind of just getting dug into at a single point. They just have to be stronger. So that probably contributes to ZIF sockets being more expensive than other kinds of IC sockets. You can just see all that contact area inside for each pin. So that's pretty nice. This would stand up to some abuse probably, but yeah, they're also expensive. And and then finally, you have these nicer IC sockets that are actually made from turned pins. And these still fit the kind of flat IC socket or IC legs that you see. Um, but they also fit round pins. So you can use these with like IC or with like resistor legs too without damaging them too much, I think. If you look inside, you can see these little leaves that press up against each side of the pin. So if you stick something flat in there, It'll just kind of wedge between like the top and bottom corners, I think. Whereas if you stick something more circular in, it'll just push all the leaves apart. I think that's what's going on in there. I haven't actually taken one of these pins completely apart. Oh yeah, the round pin sockets are really nice. And then these, so the, the other IC sockets here, I mean, I guess most of these IC sockets are kind of stackable because they tend to use the same compatible technology for their own pins. So here you've got the, the kind of flat pieces of metal, and then you've got a flat piece of metal. And so if you stack these, are we going to be able to see that? Are going to be able to see the uh, money shot in there? These are different sizes, of course. There we go. So you can see that going in between those two and getting good spring pressure without deforming anything too far out of the way. So that's pretty much how these are supposed to work. And you can stack these pretty safely. But if you look at the circular pins, they're not right, they're not like compatible with these. You wouldn't want to stack the circular pins on the flat ones and vice versa, but where do I just put that? Oh, right over here. Look at these, we should be able to see some similar stacking action. So these have round sockets on the top, they're so nice. And then round sockets on the bottom. These are often called machined pin sockets because they, I don't know if they actually make them like this, but one way you would make them and the way they probably make the really fancy ones is like on a lathe. I guess these are probably made on lathe. You can see, I guess those look like turning marks, like coarsely turned and then plated. It'd be interesting to know more about the manufacturing of these. All right, let's try mating these. Yeah. See, that's, that's really nice. And that's a different kind of physical connection than you'd see from putting an IC into this socket, but it still works. There's a nice positive lock there. It kind of snaps in. All right. Um, so, I mean, we could use something like that, but the main issue here is that we need something that's compatible with the square profile that we have. So 
you know, that would be something more like this. You see the internals of this as it works. I mean, we could change to a different shape. Square is just what's already on the adapter that I made. And square is very common. It's what I usually use for my prototyping adapters. So, kind of like that. And you can kind of see how if you just like jammed random stuff into there, then it would bend the pins in the wrong way and it would just no longer be this precise thing that makes contact. All right, let's clean up this mess later. So is this what I want to use? Hmm. <laughs> My desk is instantly messy. So for this, I, I've got some of these, which are not ideal, but they're just like long box headers. And uh, I can imagine sticking this into a little, I mean, I don't know, it would almost end up being like building another one of these, like sticking this into a circuit or like through a bit of strip board and then just soldering wires along the edges and then still having this free to plug in logic analyzer bits and pieces. I don't know if that's what I want though, because like I already made this other adapter. I'd like to just use that. So I have this. Hmm. Okay, let's think about that and try to make forward progress still. You can always try a different device. So you also might notice the Nintendo DS here. I thought that might be a fun device to play with. I realized in getting stuff prepared for the stream that I think I maybe don't have the right AC adapter for it. I think I could find the AC adapters for the DSi, but not the DS Lite. So I ordered one of those USB power adapters for it, but until that gets here, it might be a little perilous because I don't have a way to charge it. It's just got whatever battery is in there. Well, this might be the option, like one of these little eight row things. And then a separate ground. Hmm. Uh, I mean, yeah. I was also thinking maybe it would be nice to make something that just interfaced directly with these flat cables but that might be later on if I'm thinking about ever making a circuit board for this custom. <laughs> and our next is to solder another header to that since you have the long, extra long pins anyway. I would only want to do that if I had this on a circuit board because these are not square pins, they're flat pins, which makes this whole thing kind of floppy. So these are not especially good, even though they're long. I don't, like I got these assuming they might make good stacking headers, but because these are such floppy pins, then they're not actually amazing stacking headers. They work, but they're not great. <laughs> okay, um, oh, how do I say the name? Uh, Plop splip it, plop splip splap a doodle, plop splip a doodle. Is that it? <laughs> That's a fun one to say. Uh, it says that they think the the turn the machined pins are cast and then polished. That seems nice. Um, but yeah, I I would be more, I would more expect them to be done with just like a single CNC machine that has a bunch of tool heads on it. So that the they just move like a, I mean it could even move the work pieces. So like maybe there's just like a big plate of of like partially completed just like pins sticking up, and then there's just a big array of drills that just goes around and like, I mean I don't know exactly how the geometry would work. I guess you need like several spinning pieces, and then like a one-dimensional array of cutting tools that just goes down and moves around. 
starting to design the factory for these things already in the chat. <laughs> Tim Williams uh, posits that lathes are self-reproducing and they can make smaller lathes. That's kind of the idea behind RepRap, right? Um, okay, well, where are we going next here? I would like to find a nicer way to attach ground here, but maybe I just tear apart one pin off of here. Um, blah. Let's also just see if I have any prepped jumpers that are copper, because that would save some time. Okay, what do we got? This one. Mm-hmm. If you can hold it up with magnets, it goes in the trash. Uh, like, I don't know what to do with this wire. It's just so bad. I don't know. I don't think I would use it for anything. Ugh. just the connectors, it's the wire. These, yep. These, yep. These seem fine. Although these aren't really what we've been using. These are servo extension leads. And maybe, maybe they're aluminum, but I don't know. They are not steel. What these? These are also non-magnetic, so I won't throw them out yet. Ooh, that was a stick. This is sad. Why are all these the same color? Oh, these are not magnetic either. These might do. Oh yeah, I think I got those much longer ago. They're from a different batch. Is that where these came from too? They have a different style of insulation. Yeah, I think this one that I saw earlier and I was like, this one isn't bad. I think that might be the same batch as these. Um, so far these black ones actually look the best. Let's see how much copper is in those. Assuming it's copper. Let's throw these away. Sorry, applying my head to the microphone here. Oh, shall I sacrifice one of these? I think maybe I will. Ah, it's not terrible. It's thin, but it's not just like two strands like some of these are. And it looks coppery. It's certainly at least copper plated. Can we scrape it a little? Looks fine. Let's try to get a closer view under the microscope. Well, I don't know. Is that aluminum? Hmm. I mean, it's possible something is wearing off 
the knife, maybe? No, the knife shouldn't be plated with anything silly like that. Can we get a better view? I just need to order a bunch of really good copper wires, but the really nice stuff is either do-it-yourself or expensive from what I've seen. I should see if Adafruit has any good kits that I can check out and are sure that they're definitely not like some terrible pot metal, that it's actually copper. So you're seeing it kind of get shiny and sparkly and change color a little bit, but I don't know how, if that's actually the coating coming off or just optics. I think it might just be optics. I think that's copper. All right, let's use these. Hmm. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to refer to the source code to remember what the pinout is supposed to be again. Not that. Um. This. Oh yeah. Yeah, we've been to the we've been to the flame test thing in an earlier stream, and I was actually misled quite a bit by assuming that that was accurate. When in fact, if the wire is thin enough, it can melt because the melting point is actually under a butane flame. So, yeah. So I was trying to look at the surface finish, but then now, um, yeah, James is pointing out in chat that a lot of the color of copper is from the oxide layer, and fresh copper is a lot lighter. So yeah, I think I think it's likely it's actually copper. Let's work on that assumption. <laughs> just laughing at Tim Williams' comment in YouTube chat. Now you know what you have to do. <laughs> now you know what you have to do, laddie. Burn the house down. Burn them all. What's that a reference to? Feels like it's some, some movie with someone that you shouldn't listen to. <laughs> one, of the, one of those bad voices in your head, that kind. Um... That's right, this is the target specific code. We have clock command data. Okay, so this is the order that I define the pins in. Is that how these are labeled? In fact, it is. Clock, ground, card detect, and for data. Okay. I hope what I'm hearing is Tuco peeing in the litter box. So maybe Tuco is actually not asleep anymore. If that isn't what I'm hearing, I'm kind of worried. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure that was what it was. What it was actually. I think those. I'm seeing two pins that seem to be labeled ground. Let's just make sure those are connected. worth using both of those, but for now, let's just connect one ground, and then clock, I guess, next. The way I did this before was I just kind of put everything on this little breakout and then bundled it together with Kapton tape so that it would be easy to just unplug the whole thing. I don't know if this is going to fix the signal integrity problem, but it'll at least be one thing we can try. Um, all right, and so C8, which side is that? That is this side. Clock. C8. 
9 is command, which is CD on here because all the abbreviations are two letters. And then data is. You'd think I would have started the data at something that was on an 8 byte align or an 8 pin boundary, but no. It's just like right here. Hey, Tuco. Testing out my keyboard, I see. Still works. I guess we should reposition the cat cam. Oh, I said this at the very beginning of the stream, but for anyone who wasn't here, or wasn't here then, um, and for anyone where it's Friday in your time zone, happy Friday. All right, I think that's what I wanted. We have ground and we have some stuff that's actually bundled together. Oh, did Tuco just change the channel? Thanks, Tuke. Okay, I'm unplugging the FPGA, so this should just be, again, the logic analyzer, our wiring, and the kind of pass-through FPGA thing, or pass-through SD card adapter that we're going to use with the FPGA. I'm actually just using this to loop the capped on tape around so it's a little easier to deal with. tighten that up when I have that out, but that'll be enough to keep it together for the moment. <laughs> this is in the way. Let's move this out of the way in a way that it won't just end up in my foot. That might be optimistic. Okay. Let's see if this is any better. Oh, Tuco sitting on the power supply. be more mobile than I can keep track of right now. Oh, that's a good question. Good, uh, so Dan, Dan Wee CC suggests I should test a, try a chemical test for copper. Um, and James says it doesn't help if it's copper plated, but yeah, if you scraped off the outer layer, that might help. Sodium hydroxide. Interesting. Yeah, I'll think about that. That's a good suggestion. Okay, I think I just want to try exactly the same test. So the SD card is in here, the one that we know the camera works with. And that should be in all the way. And I'm just going to trigger the scope for a single capture after pressing the button, but before it's actually powered on. Hmm. Well, I mean, I have this wired a little differently now. Um, D0 right now is, is going to be clock. Is that right? 
Hmm. I think I've got that wired up so that D0 is clocked. That just doesn't look like much of a clock signal. Um, it looks like I don't have this showing the signals that I had before. mechanical issue or was it just not plugged in all the way? Oh, we saw a flash of clock on D0. Is it even set to the right voltage standard? Yeah, right. Okay, well, I was going to break out the analog probes. Let's uh, keep on that. Oops. The drawer with the probes in it is right next to all the buttons that switch channels. Ah, bad design there. mostly interested in clock and command right now. So these first two pins. Of course, having enough grounds for everything always turns out to be a problem. I always should have added more grounds. So, and I'm just going to plug the O-scope analog channels in here at the bottom where the FPGA would usually hook in. Oof. Oh, a box cat wants some attention, or maybe a clean litter box. I cleaned it this morning, but I think he just went, and he seems to meow right after he uses the litter box. Like, I just made this, clean it up right away. All right, crap. Maybe not right now, maybe soon. Eww, what is that? Oh, do we just have an insufficient logic threshold here? Oh, did it just turn off? that just go? There we go. That 
is a little low. I mean, that, I guess that might just be the battery voltage. No, that's lower than I'd expect the battery to be. I mean, maybe the battery is just low. Um, this shows the battery is being charged. Let me actually measure that voltage there. <laughs> peak to peak is five volts, thanks. <laughs> you can see where it's measuring the peaks, right? Let's just use a cursor. Um, cursor is in measure mode. Okay, so 3.3 volts is up there. Uh, up there. We're a little under it, but not concerningly so. That's fine. Um, why is this not showing up on the scope? Are we just failing at logic thresholds? So, I thought we were going to have a logic threshold down here. Um, 1.4 volts. That should be fine. Is strange. Hmm. Let me probe that like exactly where the logic analyzer is plugged in. Oh, I saw something show up momentarily. What was that? Tuco, such a jumper. Oh, something in the overshoot or the ringing was changing. Just oh, maybe that was a bad ground. Like one of these scope probes had its ground fall off, but the other one is still grounding it. Anyway, this is still not explaining why the why the signal is not showing up on the logic analyzer. Tuco is kind of in the way. How does anyone have enough grounds? I'm just gonna take one of these probes out and focus on just the clock. That should be going into the logic analyzer pretty much directly. I probe the actual physical pin that it's plugged into. is on the same piece of metal so the problem is elsewhere is it maybe a bad connection on the back of the scope sleep again, didn't it?
Oh, was that it? Did I just need to reseat the connector in the back of the scope? Great. That's a new stupid problem to have. That one has not bit me yet. <laughs> All right, maybe that was the problem. I mean, that doesn't explain the signal integrity issues, but explains why we can't see the problem. Let's see if we can take another stab at capturing the behavior when it powers on. Anytime you're holding down that button, it still keeps driving down the clock, driving the clock, it looks like. Anyway, back to single mode. Okay, we need to zoom out a little. Let's zoom out a lot. It also, oh, it's not succeeding, so maybe it won't take that long to fail. Let's find out. So powering it off again. And then power it on and hit single after powering the power button. Ooh. <sighs> Morgan says, uh, reconnectors, I spent four hours trying to figure out why machine wasn't seeing a disk that wasn't plugged in. Yeah, I think many of us have been there, if not all of us. <laughs> um, so there's the command, it's a little crunchy. Maybe I should put the scope back on that now. Because you see some glitches down there. That. <laughs> Let's get a more analog view of what's going on there. Mm. I think that's probably an all right zoom level. It might be a little far out, but it'll probably cover the problem we need to see. All right, that's our single trace. We can zoom in again. Um, in case you're not familiar with this feature, a lot of scopes have this thing where you can just zoom in and it shows the overall waveform on the top and then the actual window on the bottom. And you still have a limited amount of resolution, so you'll hit some point where it just starts looking like there is not as much data as it's trying to display, but sample buffer is actually pretty deep in this scope, so. Um, Still looks pretty all right. That's interesting. Okay, so we can see the, the clock on top, and then on the bottom, that's the command signal, which in SPI mode, um, yeah, maybe this is just using SD mode, and then that's the direction turnaround. So when it switches directions, the side that was talking will kind of let it float, and then you see it just kind of acting like a capacitor settling to ground there. And then the other side talks. So maybe that fluctuation there wasn't a problem. That was just the, the kind of slowly sagging waveform that you see when nobody's talking. But then you kind of superimpose a little bit of jagged crosstalk, like from each edge of the clock, kind of creating a tiny edge on the data. Then you see some of those edges showing up on the analyzer. Um, but anyway, this does not make it obvious what the problem is. We might need to either look a little further down or, because like, I don't know whether this is a command that it's going to always send a bunch of times, just like some of the resets, it's usual to just send, a, send them a bunch, or whether it's polling and not getting the response that it expects. Um, so we could actually look at these bits and see what that means, uh, which I think I'll do in a sec. I think the first thing I want to do is just I just want to get a broader view of what's going on here. Oh, Cloud really wants to hang out. 
Let's see if we can get that much data. Well, that's different. Looks like maybe it's trying something a bunch and then giving up. I don't think the scope knows how to decode SD. Um, let's just make sure, but I don't think it's that smart. It knows how to decode a lot of other things, like the USB is pretty awesome, but not SD. Um, I think SIGROC can decode SD though, or at least some of it. That's how I was doing some of this debugging. Oh, I think there was also a Salia Logic plugin that I might have been using. So I was sending a bunch of these commands, whatever this is. It looks like a bunch of copies of the same thing. Oh, in this view, it's collapsing the data and clock onto the same line, which is not helpful. Let's see what it's doing. Because it's just running out of space. Let's put the control and the unused data up there. There we go. Now we can at least see things a little more clearly. Okay, and then these commands are different at the end. So yeah, we, we can decode these a little bit later. Um, oh, it's really tempting to just decode them right now, but I think it'd be better to get out a separate tool. Because um, these, these get super tedious to decode by hand. I don't really want to bother with that right now. Um. Okay, so making progress on this probably means figuring out what these commands are and figuring out what the difference is between what's happening and what it expects to happen. But it's probably electrical in nature given that it doesn't work when the cable's long and has a logic analyzer attached and it does when there is no cable. Um, I wanna take a brief intermission and switch to the Nintendo DS while we still have some battery power on that. I just wanna see if we can see anything interesting from that, kind of for fun. One thing that's a little bit interesting about this, so this, I mean, the Nintendo DS itself, at least this one does not have an SD slot. The DSi did, but this is just a DS Lite. But this is a flash cart. Um, so this runs a bunch of games off of a cartridge. This is the Revolution 4. And it then has an SD card, which has the games and the menu loader that it ends up running. So let's see if we can run this with the scope in the picture because I think that might be fun. All right. So it's still gonna be triggering on a clock, but we should have a clock signal soon. It's, whoa. <laughs> Servo AF failure. So let's put that card back in the fleur. <laughs> Hedgeberg asks, uh, what did they miss? They see a DS flash card. Um, I'm just messing with SD card emulation in this stream mostly, and just floundering with random electrical problems for the most part, but I was tired of this device I was testing, so I'm gonna try an SD flash card that also, or um, a DS flash card that uses SD, just to have something else to throw on the scope and maybe emulate a card at. So. This one is going to load a menu binary from the SD card right after it boots. So like if I took this SD card slot and just left it empty, this is not gonna wanna boot. I think it'll give you a little error screen. Yeah, so it does this, but let's see if we can make some progress. So that was loading the menu pretty successfully. Cool. And then 
Whoops, what did I load? So if you're browsing through the directory structure here, it, it'll actually be loading stuff. Um, like, yeah, I think these icons get pulled off of SD card. What am I trying to serial decode this as? Let's turn that off. Oh, look at all the noise in that data line, the green one. My grounding is not amazing right now, for sure. Oh. Why do we end up on low brightness? That's not helpful. I don't know how I just changed the brightness. I was trying to change the volume, and I think I accidentally changed the brightness also. Anyway, let's just run something. Oh, I don't know why the brightness is so low. Anyway, we can go to, is this a recent build? You just can't see any of this. I'm wondering if this is because the battery is low, but I don't think the battery is low. Can we go to the main DS menu screen? I guess I have to unplug the flash card to get there. I think this flash card is actually exploiting something in the, in the menu before it finishes loading. So the menu doesn't even give you the usual screen that lets you open the card. Oh, Jarrett said I might have bumped a shoulder button. Hedgeberg says the screen brightness is configured on the main monitor. You mean, I assume you mean like this thing? Cause like there's usually a, an icon down here, right? But the, the flash cart has its own thing. So. Oh, this autofocus is terrible sometimes. So yeah, I don't think this is a normal card. I think it's kind of an exploit that like loads itself into the menu. So it boots a little strangely. So shoulder buttons, is that something to try? D-pad. Poke, poke, poke. Whoa. Oh, this was the multimedia player, AKA Moonshell. And that changed the screen brightness. Do I have any music to play? I have the sound off right now because I didn't want the bot poking me. And these are not audio files, these are games mostly. Tracker, does this have, oh, this has audio files. Is this actually playing now? It's making noise, kind of. Oh, there it goes. It's really quiet. Let's try something more interesting. Oh, stop trying Servo AF, you're doing a terrible job. Okay, how do I reboot this? Well, I do actually have a game on here with lots of music. I just, I don't know why I got the brightness set so low. So, back in this shell. This is the shell app I, I was in. Oh, left shoulder when you're in this particular shell app, not the previous menu. We'll change it. Okay, great, thank you. That was helpful. So now I'm here. There's some actual homebrew in here. Like this is the Robot Odyssey DS port I was working on for a little while. Um, so this actually has a little load menu. Which of these are actually good. And then when you're in here, you can actually, 
I don't know if anybody played this. This was a DOS game that I was pretty into. This is a partially complete Robot Odyssey port, and it's even kind of a bad build at that because um, this is set to run way too fast for some reason. I think I had like a speed up mode for debug. But basically this is a game, like an adventure game that you play by building logic circuits. And I have a partially complete port that's, it's not a source port, it's a static binary translation where I translate the original binary into C++ code and then add a bunch of extra stuff to it. But so I would, I would run stuff like this on the DS. You can see it mostly doesn't load from the SD card because it just loads a single binary image and it starts. Oh yeah, Jarrett says, uh, was this the thing where you were emulating tiny pieces of the game to draw the icons and stuff? Exactly. Yeah, I would. I had this tiny lightweight VM basically that ran statically binary translated code from the game. And so I could like fork off different instances of the game just to run the status updates on the menu. Um, and then I have, these are actually just copies of games I had. Uh, I didn't have any GBA games, but I had some Nintendo DS games. And these, you should actually see them loading at runtime, like Elite Beat Agents. So it's loading it down here. But then I think what this does is it's loading like a little image into RAM. So the Nintendo DS games include uh, little code and data images for each processor. There's an ARM 9 and an ARM 7 on this, on this thing. So there's a little image for each processor. Then there's also kind of a file system that gets streamed from the card as the game needs stuff. So most flash cards, at least the ones from this era, worked by patching the game so that their loader routines, instead of talking to the real Nintendo DS card, they would send special commands to the FPGA in this flash card asking it to read files off the SD card. So that's what you see over here, I think. I think this is streaming the background music, which I'll, I'll unmute just very briefly occasionally, but I don't want the copyright bot spamming me with ownership claims or whatever. Um, this is a rhythm game I used to be really into. And so I assume a lot of the traffic you're seeing is the background music. You're just hearing that right now. And so if we had an SD card interposer, like if we had some code we could write to get in between every block this was reading, we could try like replacing the background music or replacing the level data while it was reading it. And we wouldn't even need code that's specific to the SD card or to the Nintendo DS. We could just do this because it has an SD card slot and we don't need to know what's in between necessarily. This thing is patching the game for us already, but then we could interpose with our own data. So that's the kind of fun thing that I'd like to be able to do more of with this. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, what are we doing here? This is a really good rhythm game. I don't know. It's It involves tapping stuff on the screen. There's an arcade game kind of like this that they have at the Japantown Arcade in San Francisco. Oh, yeah, there's like a whole intro thing that's happening up there, which I'm going to skip. It's great, but... That's not what I want to do right now. Oh, I keep expecting this to be faster, but this is, I think, on the easy mode. Oh. I'm also really not in practice this game. But the basic idea is it has a bunch of little targets that you time with the music and I should mute the audio because I don't want the copyright bot spamming me. But yeah, I don't know. It's a thing. You're also really supposed to play with this with the stylus and not your finger. Anyway, I'm curious what would happen if we introduced some bit errors into here, but I think it would probably just crash. Did we lose a connection or is it just not loading anything during this part? Maybe all of this was already in RAM? Or did I lose a connection? Let's try that again. Maybe we just lost the cartridge. Oh yeah, that definitely, I mean, if it wasn't out before, the thing that I just did definitely pulled it out, okay. I 
thought I got this R4 shortly after they came out, so I would be surprised if it was a copy, but I haven't shopped for one of these in ages. This whole setup is pretty old. I don't know, so this seems all right. Like, I, I would need to get, do a lot of work in the actual SD card emulation to get to this point, but it might be fun just to like see how like when we run the emulator and see how far it gets. But This test at least tells me that the electrical situation here isn't too terrible for it to make progress most of the time. Um, do I have any other homemade games on here that are interesting? Oh, this is like a fan-made portal type of game for Nintendo DS, which is really cool. It's called Still Alive DS. Did I make the screen dim again? It just isn't very bright to start with. It just, it just like clicked the clock into overdrive there. Are we failing to get background music here? Or is this just like random sound? Oh, I'm like down here. Oh, I can jump. How do I portal? How you shoot. It might also be broken, who knows. We are operating this in uncharted territory. Okay, I remember this working at some point, but it might be broken currently. I tried touching. This one's a music player, but I think it stores everything in RAM after ro after loading. I didn't have an aux in handy for this. Oh, these are all just mapped to sound effects and there's some background music. This is just like a demo for a mixing library that I was playing with. Well, that's a couple of things. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to see on the Nintendo DS, but it seems like at least this gets far enough that we could try making it to the next step. Um, the next step might actually be to try to run the SD card emulator on this FPGA. So, let's plug that in. this set up in a VM already. So one problem with most FPGA is like, you can alleviate this somewhat if you, well actually quite a bit if you use something like the ICE40 where there's an open source tool chain. But for the most part, FPGAs require these giant packages of tools that you have to download from the FPGA manufacturer. And so in this case, I have like a 30 gigabyte VM full of Xilinx tools. And, there's the flipsy fat directory, which is my project. Um, oh, I don't think I have a key on here anymore. That's fine. Let's use the public uh, HTTP. I could set up a key on this machine, but that isn't really something I want to do on stream. So I'm just going to switch this to use the public repo since I don't really care about committing right now or pushing. Cool. 
Um, so we have make files in the individual software directories. These are where the firmwares that we're making actually get built. Um, the process of building the hardware here involves running a Python kind of generator program that then takes over the build process and uses all the Xilinx tools on here to actually build the FPGA image. So like, can we actually run the Xilinx tools on here? Is there like an ISC? Um, I forget actually if, what the entry points are for this. So it just comes with a whole bunch of binaries. Um, some of these are really important for the build process, and then some are just, there's just like a lot of other tools for viewing very specific things. Um, can we run the, I always want to run the FPGA editor because it's the graphical tool that actually shows you what all the little logic blocks in the FPGA are doing, but it always seems to require the most GUI dependencies and it's always broken. I thought it was already in my path, but I mean, so the, the opt whatever would just be redundant here. If it's not in my path, then it's probably gonna fail because it'll be missing libraries that also need to be in my path. Um, this looks right. <laughs> um, oh, is it not in my path? Okay, then maybe I do need to run that settings thing. Um, where is that? And this, all this opt Xilinx stuff is just stuff you can download from their website. It's just annoying to set up because it's all so huge. Um, I don't know if this will work. Yeah, that isn't the issue. Anyway, I don't think we need that tool. It's just fun when it works. So we have uh, flipsy fat. I'm gonna make sure my repo here is clean because I wanna make sure we just build everything here for illustration's sake at least. So I'm just gonna remove all that and this is the output directory, right? Yeah, that's the build directory. I can just remove that whole thing. Get clean would have deleted that if I gave, given it the whole remove directories flag. Why do I have uncommitted changes here? These are just the changes that I was actually using for that last PLC glitching experiment. Um, I'm just gonna stash these. I don't care about them, but I don't necessarily want to delete them. Okay, did I actually, what did I put in the readme? Uh, just some basics. I think this is just, um, does this already have Python 3 in there? Yeah, so just set up develop, I think is what I want. Hmm, that's fine. Actually, what? I don't know that I need to install this. Why do I have set up here? Um, that's for dependencies. That grabs my sock as a dependency. That's fine. Um, what is, I'm forgetting how I just grabbed the dependencies without actually installing anything to the path because I think that's the level of commitment I'm looking for here. Just build. Oh, I must have done this as root before. I 
I think I've already got the dependencies here, which would make sense because this is where I was developing it before. So, um, yeah. So anyway, you end up with this script. I think we can just run this. Maybe you run that from the correct directory. I think this is why I have a make file. Yeah, that's why I have a make file. So to synthesize it, I'm just running that script, but this just makes it a little bit simpler. And then this also has a target for flashing it to the Papilio board using this separate, uh, separate flasher tool. So let's just do that. Really? The compiler is trying to use the version of lib standard C++ in op Xilinx. Is that what's going on? Uh, let's just get a fresh shell that doesn't have all of the Xilinx settings spooge in it and then compile it and then see where that fails. Because actually, maybe, maybe we don't need the entire environment. I think we might, like, MySock has its own layer of stuff that wraps around Xilinx's tools, and I think they might already, like, in their build scripts, know how to find everything and set the right environment variables. So let's work on that assumption for a sec. That looks better. Okay, so this first part, it was compiling some, uh, so this is basically the BIOS, that's what they call it, the, like the little built-in monitor ROM that's included with the processor in the system on chip. And it's just enough code to load the rest of your program, at least that's how it's intended. So that's why we're compiling some code. And then we're running the Python code and generating Verilog, but then all the rest of this is coming from the Xilinx, the Xilinx tools for the FPGA. So yeah, so there's the code, and then we're not even really seeing, I mean, in fact, the, the Python generating Verilog stuff might have even happened before the code compiling, because that part does not take very long. And then the rest of this is it actually taking that description of a very high level machine that was generated by the Python code, and eventually turning it into some actual gates. So there are various stages here. Mapping it involves taking this like net list, this description of what hardware should connect to what other hardware, and then mapping it to the available blocks that are in the FPGA. And then you actually have to take that sea of blocks that you want to implement and figure out where each block actually goes and run the routing between them. So you have to run this whole thing anytime you change the hardware part of this project. So anything that's like, the way the peripherals on the system on chip work, rather than just what the code is running on, or what, what code is running on it. Which is one of the reasons why it's nice to have a general purpose processor. You can recompile that code much faster. FPGAs are kind of notoriously slow to compile for, although um, that FPGA that's kind of smaller with the open source tool chain, the ICE40 that I mentioned earlier, that actually, the tool chain compiles very fast. So that's actually kind of a nice selling point for the open source tools. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are, um, Leonard Rowland was, was saying that we're writing some fat code in an FPGA, it seems in the YouTube chat. Yeah, that's pretty much what we're doing. Um, the FPGA itself is doing the SD card emulation, and then the software that's running on the CPU in the FPGA is, run, is doing the FAT emulation. And it's all already written, like this was a project I did like last year, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of trying to resurrect it a little bit and just try it out and see where it fails on some new devices. Because I only really tried this out with a couple of devices. And so I had a couple other things here, like this thermal camera and this Nintendo DS flash cart, just as some things to try out. I also have a regular SD card reader, but that's been boring. Is 
Is it using all of our cores here? Not really. I think this is a multi-core VM. We have two virtual cores, which means we should be seeing like 200% CPU. Maybe this is just not a parallelized process. Oh, that is just even more the slowness if we have to synth our FPGAs on one core. So all that stuff it was doing up there was, oh man. What was that? Placement optimization, global placement, placement validation, writing output files. Maybe it's doing timing simulation now. So that was figuring out where to put all the logic. Then it was like actually writing the output files and giving us a summary of what happened. This is like how much of the FPGA we're using. We've used 82% of the slices, 33% of the registers, etc. You can see that we've got something in pretty much every slice on the FPGA, so it's pretty full, but not completely for sure. Then constraints. I don't know why it's giving us two device utilization summaries here. It looks like it's just running this twice. Why does that make any sense? Was this generating two bit streams for some reason? Nine K block RAMs. I don't think those are initialized here. I think that's just cache memory or something. Or not cache memory, just like the main no, the main memory here is DRAM. This board has like eight megs of DRAM, and so I actually have way more RAM than I need for this experiment. Yeah, this this is like a little microcontroller in the FPGA, but so like this red board is the FPGA board. This big chip is the Spartan 6. It's got the emulation and the processor and all this other glue in it as a soft core. And then this over here is DRAM. I think it's eight megs. And I think we were mapping that to just the main memory on the processor, the way this is set up. OK, so can we flash it? We need to, oh, so there it is. This FTDI FIFO, I think, is this FTDI chip right here, which is connected to the programming interface on the FPGA. Hey, Tuke, don't fight. <laughs> the least effective thing I'll ever say to Tuco. See if we can flash this. Partial erase. <laughs> Morgan says that Xilinx apparently charges a lot of money for synthesizing on multiple cores, because only professionals would want that, right? Yeah. This is also not the fastest process, but. So you do this anytime you're changing the actual hardware design, but then you saw I had several different pieces of example code. I could just like switch between those just by loading code into RAM. So that's what we'll do next. This image has the, the hardware. Well, it's calling it gateware because it's like kind of in between hardware and software. Um, so gateware and the BIOS image, which is just like the first chunk of software that the CPU runs, are going to be in this file. So it's like, there's like an SPI flash on this board, single serial flash, and it has first the FPGA bitstream and then concatenated after that is the BIOS image. And I think the way this works is there's actually a little hardware state machine that does the SPI, like it loads over SPI into RAM, and then after that we're writing code from RAM. I think that's how this is set up. Anyway, so I think the next thing is we have one of these ports on the FTDI is now a serial port we can use to talk to the BIOS. 
Um, did I include that in the make file? Um, oh, so I can do this, the make load in the individual software directory. I think there's a terminal in there. So flipsyfat slash software. Simple. What do we got here? Main is simple example software. It just has some text files. I think that's a good thing to try. So this has a make load. It also has make term, which is what I was looking for. And this isn't really something that has to be in this make file. It was just convenient. It just loads a terminal emulator. There's our BIOS prompt. If we want to see that from the beginning, I think this is a hardware reset button we can poke. And it won't reset the serial port. There we go. Cool. So M Labs are the folks who make a lot of the open source tools this is using. And MySoC is this system on chip design that uses those tools. So that's saying hi. It's the SD RAM I was just mentioning, that eight megs. Test the memory. And then it has a way of automatically asking uh, the terminal emulator for a serial image, or a, for a binary image to boot. So that other make load target was actually just using a special terminal emulator that this project has, which knows how to respond to that command. Um, what is this? I was generating a random string for some reason. That's what that looks like. I don't remember what that is. Oh, I think that's part of the boot protocol. Like, I think that's like a random string that signals that the boot, that that's how it talks to the terminal emulator. Anyway, there's a whole command line here you can use to read and write memory, uh, run the test. You can also access these um, CSRs, which are control and status registers. So in fact, this program kind of knows a little bit about how to write to the named registers in the emulated hardware. Um, I don't remember any of those off the top of my head, so I'm not going to go into the detail of demoing it right now, but that is a thing that you can do. Um, how do I exit from this? There we go, control bracket. So if I ran make load, now it's connected to the bootloader. I might have to poke the reset button right now. There we go. So what it just did is it wrote this program over to the bootloader and now it's running on the system on chips CPU in the FPGA. And there's a main loop that's just printing out this status. Well, let's, let's look at the actual code. Do I need another terminal window? So let's just look at the main function here. So main, we've got some boilerplate, just setting up IRQs and hardware. And then we would have seen this scroll by right at the beginning. But then this is what's going on here. Um, this is just a tight loop that just spins really fast. And everything we actually care about really is happening in an interrupt. So there's an interrupt on this processor that fires asking us to generate a block when we're reading from the SD card. And there's also an interrupt asking us to deal with a block that's just been written when we're writing the SD card. But otherwise, we're just sitting here in this tight loop and checking to see whether one second or a tenth of a second has gone by. And if so, printing out the status. So this is just effectively going to keep rolling. And if any of those background interrupts actually do something, then we'll see these counters increment or change. So like some of these are addresses, some of them are counters. I'd like this to be wide enough so it doesn't have to wrap. OK. Let's try, uh, let's turn on the DSLR overlay. I want to try plugging this into a device and seeing if we see any activity. And for this, actually, the best device is probably just a plain old SD card reader. So this should show up on the same machine that we're experimenting with here. Um, outside the VM, I think. <laughs> so 
And so in this case, oh, I need to take out the real SD card here too, because I don't want a real SD card and an emulated SD card. Thanks. This one can go back in the Nintendo. So I just saw some stuff go by on the O-scope, which I know you couldn't see. Um, I didn't see any of these increment. I'm also not seeing anything show up. So the expected behavior, like if everything here is working perfectly, um, you plug it in and we should see a directory like in the root of the SD card that's actually just a fake directory that includes a ton of text files with sequential names because that's what the code is generating. Um, this has worked in the past. Like I did develop this on something. Um, it's possible it doesn't work with this SD card reader. So if this doesn't work after trying it another time or two, then I might just try it with a different reader. It looks like it's trying and then not making any progress after a certain point. <laughs> oh, Morgan. Morgan is smart. They ask if the FPGA is plugged in. And of course it isn't. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the analog channels in the scope are actually where the FPGA is supposed to be. So let's put that back. Good catch there. Uh, let's turn off the analogs for a sec. I can put them back if we need them. Hmm. Oh, there is no easy way of like reorganizing these digital channels once you've made a mess of them, is there? like that, kind of space out our channels a little. Um, all right. I'm making all the good mistakes. I am getting a little bit tired, but I just want to, you know, I want to do something. I, I mean, I know this is more of a meandering stream, but it'd be nice to make some progress because I always enjoy that feeling. Delicious progress. Or whatever arbitrary definition of progress you need in order to make that satisfying, I guess. Oh, I still have this set to the wrong trigger, but I think we're... I, I just saw something you didn't, and it was promising. No, nope. that's what we want. Look at that. And then, look at that. We got some numbers. And do we see a device? <laughs> no. There it is. So it took a couple of tries for it to mount. I wonder what that was about. That might be part of what we need to debug here. But now you just see a whole bunch of fake files. If you open any of these, then it tells you what cluster it was on the disk. <laughs> I like Morgan's checklist. Is the FPGA plugged? Well, the, the five rules of hardware debugging. Is it plugged in? Is there power? Is the chip flashed? Is your scope on? Did you compile the current version of your code? <laughs> yeah. OK, so you might have noticed if you're looking down here that when I'm just like scrolling through these in Finder, like, Mac OS has already loaded this whole directory. It's not like it's paging this stuff into Finder off the disk. But if I actually look at one of these files, then the contents are coming straight off of the flash drive. And you can see down here these numbers update. 
So what is this? I think RTS, WTS, and DTS are timestamps. So write, read, and delta. Is that right for data? I'll have to check the source code. Um, and then read and write down here are counters, I think. Or maybe they're block numbers. I forget what that is. We might have to check the source code. I wonder if Boxcat is hungry. Okay, so SDMU status actually is like a shared function that prints that line. Okay, so that is the address. So that's the block address and the byte address. Oh, right. That is the other infuriating thing about SD cards where this needs to support both block and byte addressing. Because like the spec kind of let you do, oh, how did this work? There's a, there's like a capability bit kind of thing where like there's a slightly different version of the protocol effectively that both sides have to agree on. And then once you've done that, you're talking about 512 byte blocks and you can address larger SD cards. So that's part of the SD high capacity spec. So that's what it's doing here. It's showing the block address and then that like dot something else is the byte portion if there is one. Anyway, the nice thing about this is like you can start interacting between the code in this processor and just code that's using the SD card. So for example, if, if I had some code on there that was returning like a command or like some new string, and I could just like read a file that we know we haven't read before, it won't be in the cache, then we can use that to read something new off the device. You can also avoid having to work around the cache by explicitly disabling caching when you open the file. And so that kind of stuff is how that Google Project Vault used this like magic SD card kind of file to, to send and receive data. It used part of the SD card as normal data storage device and then part of it as kind of a bidirectional pipe. Oh, that's a good question from Vince who asks if this is a custom or off the shelf board. This is totally off the shelf. This board is called the Papilio Pro by Gadget Factory. Another one right here it can zoom into. Pro in this case means it has RAM. So Spartan 6 with 8 megs of SD RAM and F, uh, an FTDI USB interface. And these are, I think, $80, something along those lines. And they have a decent amount of I.O. They also have good MySoC compatibility, which is part of why I chose this. It already had support for this tool chain that I wanted to use. Okay. I'm curious if we will see actual block reads here from the, uh, from the Nintendo DS. So for example, one thing we can try is without really knowing how successful this is gonna be, I can just reset this, it gets a new copy of the firmware. That's one thing that this terminal emulator does is like you can reset the board and then its bootloader will ask, hey, can I have another copy of the firmware? And then this terminal emulator will just send it from my local machine, making it a little bit faster to debug. They just have some nice features like that built in. So um, I'm gonna reset this without the device plugged in and then just plug this into the DS and boot the DS and see if I see block reads or if I just see nothing or something in between. I won't expect it to boot properly because the menu needs like its binary off the SD card which isn't on this tiny emulated SD card but I just wanna see how far this gets. Well, we got a read from the beginning of the SD card. Now it just says SDTF card error. Well, that's interesting. So that was a command. So we we know some data about this. We know the command, 
this, I'd have to look at the code to know what some of these things are, like info and card stat. So you can tell it got another read there. Okay, yeah, these are counters. RD and WR are counters. RDA and WRA are addresses. I think cats are all hungry. Oh, okay, Ktemkin also mentions that the non-pro version has a different FPGA, the Spartan 3E instead of the Spartan 6. I've, I've used the Spartan 3E also, it's a nice chip, but also kind of older. <laughs> the Magic Inventor says, could this project be used to make an SD card fuzzer to exploit drivers? Yeah, that's totally the kind of thing that I bet this would be helpful for. Okay, well, no luck with that, but let's just keep trying some of these other demos. Oh, I think Boxcat wants some food. I might have to take a break for that in a sec. Um, let's put this back in here and just see if any of the other demos are interesting. So that was just making a whole bunch of files. That was simple. Um, word list is the one that I made for the previous like directory entry guesser kind of thing, um, which is currently the most complicated one. There's also edit file, dentry frob, and block frob are all kind of things that are meant to hex, to hex edit a specific part of the file system. So block frob. I think this just returns the same data for every single block and lets you edit that data. And this was just like a really early thing that I did because I wanted to try to find dependencies between data I could change and like timing elsewhere in the system. And it was just an easy like kind of early step to test my tooling. So this also uses a little common component that several of the examples share, which is an interactive hex editor. Let's try this. So I think I need to reboot this. Okay, block frob. So now I have this. It looks like it's all zeros at first. Um, and you also have that same status line. So if I plug this in down here, we should see the OS start to try to do something with it, but it won't see a partition table. So <laughs> yeah, OS 10 does not see a partition table, cool. So I'm gonna ignore, but then, Oh, like what disk was that? So, yeah, 32 megabytes is just a hard-coded size in my SD card emulator, but you could easily change that. Um, anyway, disk three, um, S1 is the partition, but I don't really care about that. I'm gonna use R disk three. So, and I need to be root for that, right? Since this machine has a throwaway password, but I'll hide it anyway. All right, see that? So I'm just streaming data off this SD card. Um, it'll stop when it hits 32 megs, I guess, but... So why is this not all zeros? That's something I'm curious about now. Oh, that's a partition table. Oh, is this only editing the first half and then the second half is like a fake partition table? What did I do here? What have I done? Oh, this scrolls, doesn't it? Right, there's the fake partition table. Okay, that makes more sense. And I think there's some other commands here, like I can create a window of multiple bytes and then, oh, and then I can like edit them all at once. That kind of stuff. There are actually a bunch of keyboard shortcuts that I'd have to look at the source, source code to remember. But okay, so I populate this buffer originally with something that looks like a partition table, but it only, like it's just one block and it repeats across the entire disk, which is what we can see up here. Um, and then so we can see it reading continuously 
um, this read keeps incrementing, and the address will reach the end and then start over because of the while loop that I wrote in the shell. But we should be able to just change this. Like, if I want to make something visible, then maybe I should just change a bunch of these. And you see all those U's going by? V. So this is the kind of thing I started doing, like, oh, I just want to change something and see the result on the other side, just a very simple, like, in and out of data. And, uh, but then you can start to change things that it actually cares about. So you might be able to do that with one block, but if there's any kind of file system, probably not. So that is kind of limited. Um, I think dentry frob and edit file are along the same lines, but just a little bit more, uh, a little bit more complete. So dentry frob is short for directory entry, and this lets you hex edit the actual fat directory entry that it's reading, um, which includes the file name, but also some stuff like is there a long file name entry associated with this, and is there like and like modification times and stuff. Um, and so this is kind of similar. There's a fat table, there's a root directory, there's an interactive hex editor, there's also a reset, which is something else added. So I'm going to unplug this. I'm just going to break this. Oh, why am I getting a pinwheel? Yeah, I'm not hacking a DS today, unfortunately. I just had one handy as a device that needs an SD card, and I happened to just have some weird programs on there, so I played with that a little bit, but... Okay. I actually, actually, I forgot a step. I needed to reset this so that it loads the new code, and then I'm plugging that in. Okay, so now it's loading the new, or it's running the new code. You can see I have a smaller hex editor. This one doesn't scroll. It has default.bin in there. And I think this is just going to serve a lot of copies of the same directory entry. So if I were to plug this in, I think you just see a bunch of files all named default.bin. Is this going to take a while? There we go. I don't know why it takes a sec to initialize. Like, there might be something where... Oh, does it not like this disk? It said that it need, it can't repair the disk. So maybe it's like, oh, there's a bunch of identical files. That means the disk is corrupted, but then it gave up on actually trying to fix this. So we still have a bunch of identical files all made at timestamp zero. Oh, I was trying to type something. So it'll pick one of these files to read. And then I've just got the same code in here that just prints out what cluster it's reading from. So you could actually tell which of the identically named files it chooses to read from. I think this is just the first one. But I can change this, but it won't, like, this won't reload, I think, because macOS has no reason to reload this directory cache. So this would more be something where, like, you plug this into an embedded machine and then change and then reset the embedded machine. Oot.bin, maybe. So that still says that. I'd have to actually re-power cycle this, or re-plug it at least. Oh, same error message, I assume, but yeah. So there's that. And then I think we can go one step further and actually be hex editing a file instead of just some metadata. Okay. This was something I was using near the very end of the investigation I was doing with that uh, PLC device. Because this was, I had a file name, I just wanted to try changing parts of it to see how much further it would get. But I didn't actually get to make it very much further into this, because I ended up starting work on a different project instead. It's partly why I wanted to go back and poke at this more myself, since I didn't get a chance to do it when I was doing this for my day job at the time. 
So this uses the same interactive hex editor. What else is here? We have a single, is that a single root directory entry? Yeah. If it's zero, there's the volume label. If it's one, it's a plain file. Otherwise, it's nothing. So I think we just have a single file in the root directory, which is what we're editing. And then I've just got that much data, 1,000 hex, 4K. Um, so let's try this. Make load, deboot the board. Great. So it's printing out the whole buffer up here for some reason. I forget why I'm doing that. Yeah, I don't know why this has so much extra debug stuff. So if I plug this in here, we should see the counters as usual. So this time, reads and writes. I had no error from macOS yet. There it is. Mac OS is like, I can't repair this disk. I don't know what it was complaining about this time, though. And this time, I don't see any obvious problems, so it must have some other problem. So here, now we've got our all zeros. Oh, what are all those five A's? Oh, is that just in the buffer because I haven't actually... I don't know what the five A's are coming from. Hmm. Like if I just start putting some U's into this buffer, just have something in there. Um, so I wouldn't expect this to update right away because the cache. But if I unplug it and replug it, then I should see the new file through the cache. One thing that would be really nice is to just have something that is more of a full-featured interposer, like break it down to this level where we can just interpose on every single read or write, but then also have the ability to tie that back to uh, just a real, a full file system image. Because this is all stuff that's kind of being pieced together in RAM as it's requested, which is useful in some ways, but it would also be nice to just drop in a pile of stuff that's already in the right format. Um, eight megabytes of that could certainly just fit in RAM. Um, which might actually be a good thing to do soon. Hmm. It's tempting to just like plug this into the, the FLIR camera just to see if I get any blocks coming out, but I wouldn't expect it again. Uh, we might get lucky. Oh, there's my use. All right. Card full. I think the card's full and the stream's probably about done, but let's put in a new card anyway. Aw. Game Talk on YouTube chat says, aside from the technical projects, one of the best reasons to watch is how soothing your discussions and voice are. I'm flattered, thank you. Leonard Roiland says, fly by partition table. Yeah. Oh, I think this is also the time of night where I'm hearing, or I'm smelling the neighbor cooking. And I'm wondering like, oh, is something in my shop too hot? Or is something next door being cooked? <laughs> this FPGA is not at all hot. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, let's go back to the simple one and just see if I get any blocks going out into the camera or if the problems are at like an electrical layer below where we're getting. This will just give us some counters we can use. So it'll tell us if anything's getting through.
I have to say this SD card is not easy to remove the way they put it in there. That's not promising, is it? I saw some blips go by on the O-scope, but no commands here, it looks like. Can we actually look at the O-scope here? So you've got that slow clock again. Let's try the same thing I was doing before with the single trace. Same test, but now with the emulated SD card instead of a real SD card. And uh, this is still showing, excuse me, this is still showing nothing. this working? This looks like a command. Um, if we were getting a command, I would expect to see that show up in the command, uh, this little command column in the debug display here. So let's look at the relevant code here. So look at the phi. This would actually be a good time to look at it and see if we're even trying to reply, which would actually be a little easier to see with an analog channel. Because then we can easily tell when the line goes tri-state. All right, that is the First channel viewing the data, uh, data D1. I think that's all crosstalk. It isn't actual signal. Why are we getting so much crosstalk? Maybe because the ground is huge. Let's see if it works anyway. So I'm just running the same test again. I've got to power this off first. Trigger the scope. All right. So what command is that trying to be? This is when I've got to remember how SD actually works. Um, I think there's a start bit and then like a six bit command or something. Don't I have a reference for this handy? Let me try to find a reference really quick. So it would be nice to have like a timing diagram that we can follow. We could reverse engineer it or we could try to find the actual docs. That, that's always the question, right? SD physical spec. Ah, it's the stuff. This is the simplified SD spec, which is 
something. So for a long time, this was not public, even in the slightest. But then they released this simplified spec fairly publicly. I don't know why it still says confidential in the corner, but you can see here that this is clearly a non-confidential version of the original document here. So, so it leaves off a bunch of the advanced features like the security stuff, but for pretty much most things you'd want to do with an SD card, this will tell you. So SPI mode, protocols, I'm looking for a timing diagram of the command format. Yeah, so I mentioned the kind of asynchronous stuff before where there's basically two separate pipes for command and data and they can overlap like this. This kind of illustrates why that's helpful. Okay, command token. Zero, one, content, CRC, one. Can we get the scope on the same screen? That would be amazing. Yeah. Okay. And maybe a scratch terminal here. So we have a, oops. Zero, one, one. Or one zero zero rather. So zero one because we assume this starts with a zero. Zero one zero zero one zero one zero one 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 or one and then the bus turnaround. So right there is where the voltage starts to dip. So and then we should be seeing zero one as the header content. Um, this is saying, I mean, yeah, this is saying the command token is 48 bits. This is not a full length command token. What are we even looking at here? Is this the end of the command token? Is this just the CRC and the start bit is somewhere else? Let's zoom out because maybe I'm, maybe I'm thinking these are two separate commands when it's really just like the beginning and the end of one command. Um, let's get another, another capture. this any better? Oh yeah, that might be the start bit. I think that is where the word might begin. So now I just have two cursors spaced eight bits apart and I'm just gonna read these bits off. Double check that's eight, actually eight, but Seven. I need to count these again. Two bits, three bits, four bits, five, six, and eight bits. Okay. Scope screen is getting a little busy there. Might be able to set this to SPI with some kind of weird start bit setting and get it to decode some of this, actually. Because the issue is like the bit, the bytes here are not synchronous with the, like where the clock starts, they're synchronous with the start bit. So it's like, oh, this, the scope must have a mode for this, right?
right, that's a little less cluttered. We're not getting any bites here. Clock is D0. Yeah. Rising edge? Sure. Mosi, D1. Why not? Miso. Sure. D2. We're not going to use that. CS, timeout. Yeah, why not? Like, that seems like it should work. Maybe I just need to run another trace. Oh yeah, I guess so. That isn't really gonna be lined up though. I'm probably gonna have to bit shift a whole bunch, but maybe that's better than reading off data manually. Uh, there's a question from Morgan. There's a flip at each clock rise in that digital line. Is the clock is the clock on rise and fall? I think you're just seeing the crosstalk in the digital line from the clock. That isn't the data changing. That's just noise at the scale. So see the large jumps that are like more than one grid square are the actual data bits, and then the small jumps are just crosstalk from bad grounding. And I, I don't know if that's a problem or not. It might just be an issue with this scope probe, but it might be an issue in the setup as a whole. But right now, my the thing I'm trying to do is just decode the packet that I'm getting. And maybe this is the easy way to do it now. So, so oh, oh, 20, then four oh, oh's, four A, E, O, 20. I think only the first little bit of that is what we actually want, but um, I want to line that up so that we're looking at I want to line it up according to this diagram here. Zero, 01 content, etc. total 48 bits. So zero, 01 that means this whole thing needs to start with a uh, hex like 4 in that position. So I think this needs to be shifted over by 1. I think that's our packet right there. Let's see if that makes any sense. Is that just all zeros content wise? I think we got that. Sure. Right, so the bottom byte is the CRC and the stop bit. So all of that is zeros. I think that's fine. So if we are getting that, um, I think command zero is just like the uh, the idle reset, but we we wouldn't see the command counter change from zero, or the sorry, the last command received. Um, and I don't think that firmware actually had a counter for commands, did it? So maybe that's the issue. Anyway, it looks like 
Is that us trying to respond? Anyway, let, let's just look up command zero. I think it's a reset, but... Or is that the one that switches you to, to SD, SPI mode? Go idle. So I assume we don't need to do much with this. Just is there a reply? This is part of the card initialization. Like I think some of these early commands might be related to like voltage negotiation, and we just we just don't implement a lot of that. But let's see what the core does here. So this is the link layer, which is responsible for receiving that thing that we just decoded by hand. So like, here's the CRC that we were just looking at at the end of the byte. Here's it actually calculating the CRC. Um, and then once it has the command, it passes it from this phi, sorry, yeah, the phi, not the link layer. It passes it from the physical layer to the link layer. So I think SD link is where we actually handle commands. Yeah, this is, make, this is coming back to me. Yeah, command zero, go idle. Yeah, so I did change this because this is also used for SPI mode. SPI cell. I'm having to reverse engineer my own code all the time to remember how it works. Oh, okay, that's the signal from the phi about whether or not it's in SPI mode. I think that was something where like it checks the state of the command line at, sorry, it's like something about latching the initial state of that pin that was easier to do in the phi. And this is stuff I modified, so there's a good chance it is incorrect in some way. Although from what I hear, the original version of this didn't get a whole lot of testing either. Where are we setting this? Is a wire. Oh. Oh, it's the output of the synchronizer. What is the non synchronized version? There are, so the synchronizers just like take a logic signal and like hold on to it for a couple of clock cycles to delay it, which sometimes you might do just for purely delay reasons, but a lot of times it's done. Uh, so, for example, here it's done for clock domain crossings to reduce the probability of latch up. Was the input signal for this? It's just mo. Oh, that's an input from <laughs> from outside the phi. I had to do so much plumbing for SPI mode because it was a little bit outside the original design paradigm here. So that was common, which isn't what I want. Maybe it's in the layer above this, the one that's not written in Verilog. No, SD. All right, this is the Python code.
Okay, so this module gets its mode SPI input. The link layer generates the output. So the link, that just kind of round trips from the link layer into the phi and then back to the link layer. That's annoying. Phi mode SPI is, we are telling the phi what mode it should be in later. Okay, I think I might have just been going around in circles and reading this logic backwards, because this is actually how... Like, I was looking at spy cell S, which comes in from the... Um, from the phi? I forget why I did this. Phi mode SPI or spy cell S. Cell... Oh, is this the chip select signal? Okay, right, so I think the way that you enter SPI mode is to send this command zero with the chip select signal in the right state. Maybe I was just getting this confused with the spy mode enabled. Spy cell S, I think, might be the chip select synchronized while you're in spy mode. Yeah, okay, that was the, I was following spy cell and then I jumped to spy mode, which is how I got linked in circles. Spy cell is chip select. Yep, okay. Output enable, yeah. Anyway, there's not a lot of visibility into that part of the emulator currently. I've had to just kind of like hack and slash additional debugging in there to get anything useful out of this part of it in the past. And so we've got a turnaround here. This is command zero, CRC for command zero. I've just gotta, I don't remember any of this stuff off the top of my head. I've gotta remember how the actual bus turnarounds for this protocol work. I don't think it's supposed to be entering SD mode, given that it's tri-stating the bus, like SD, or sorry, SPI mode. SPI mode does not like let the bus fall like that. It would just continue driving it. Maybe that's the problem, maybe the, so I'm looking at the, like how does it know when the response token starts? And so there's a start bit that's supposed to be zero. But maybe that means I'm supposed to be driving that line high. Is there supposed to be a pull up? There's not supposed to be a pull up, is there? Which one is this? Input with a 50k pull-up? Oh, that's for mode selection. That's fine. I wouldn't expect there to be a pull-up on the command, because that would limit the data rate. I mean, the command or the data, right? Anything high frequency, I wouldn't expect there to be a pull-up resistor on.
There's probably a section in here somewhere that's actually talking about the turnaround between command and response. I'm just skipping over it. stuff in the spec that you don't really need but cards implement anyway. Like you can you can have multiple cards share a bus and distinguish them by their address. Which is kind of ridiculous. I don't know why you'd actually do that. But it's the thing. Hello. Hey Zach. Hey. I am currently streaming. Oh, it's kinda right. I'm near the end probably. Oh, yeah, it would be nice to make more progress, but it also just, you know, I guess that's kind of what I was expecting, is to just find a bunch of stuff that I didn't really realize would be wrong. Or just like, well, what even is broken? Because I haven't looked at this project in a while. And I don't know that I still... <laughs> well, so it looks like I've got some electrical problems that are completely independent of this setup, but just I need to be a little bit more careful when, integrate, when interfacing to this, probably if that's a thing we're doing. Um, otherwise here, it might just be that I want to kind of poke at the emulator here so that I have better ways of debugging it. But this is also just me forgetting what a regular SD card transaction looks like. We could just plug a regular card in here and look at it on the scope for reference. Maybe that's the thing to do. Oh yeah, there's so much yak shaving happening. So yeah, I'm just gonna try putting a regular card in this same device and watch what happens just, just for comparison. It is always nice to be able to compare a regular SD card and the emulated card. So it is off. Single capture. Whoa. Okay, well, same problem, actually. This looks like the same electrical. Does it want a pull-up? Is that maybe what's happening? Does it want a pull-up on that line? Even when my FPGA is just completely nowhere to be found. Hey, Tuco. Well, let's give it a 10K. 20k, something like between 10 and 100k to 3.3. Do I even have 3.3? Yeah, the power supply for the SD card is right over there. Um, yeah, well, I'm just going to touch a resistor to that and do another trace and see if it looks different. Tuco is sitting right in front of the scope now because that's where all the warm air is congregating. <laughs> I tried. Servo AF is not as fast as the cat AF. Okay, I'm gonna try 100K first and see if that makes a difference. See how weak of a non-pulling kind of situation we're dealing with here. I'm gonna assume VD means like VCC or VDD or something like that.
and okay well first of all I think I want to be able to do this without like kind of more hands free so maybe I will use uh, use oh what is that called segmented capture So I can run the scope. It's now waiting for data. Mm. Did I get what I wanted? Okay, that does look like a pull-up issue, doesn't it? So that was only 100K, um, which seems like it definitely held the line longer. Are they seriously just like trying to slide by on capacitance to hold this into one state with only a 400 kilohertz clock? Ugh. I'm not happy about this. This might be why we're having signal integrity problems. I, I mean, I don't know what the spec actually says about this, but I doubt it's supposed to be a pull-up thing. I don't know, let's try 10K. This is just a lower resistance, so it'll pull up faster and might actually give us a good signal. Oh, actually that already did give us a good signal. The little icon here means it read the SD card. So that's already enough, it just looks bad on the scope still. off, the scope is capturing again. I <laughs> got a scope full of traces. Oh, that's nice. All right, well, maybe it wants a 10K pull up. That's sad, but oh well. Oh, was that Tuco? I guess he was. Okay, um, well, let's see if this works with the emulator. Ugh, where am I gonna put this pull up? I'm just gonna poke it with my hand. Oh, or maybe I'll clip it in here with the scope probe. Get a bit of a two for one going on there. If I can actually make this work. Well, I might have to hold that also. Press, oh, gotta turn this off. Otherwise it'll fill up my scope buffer right away. Turn it off, trigger the scope. Luna is almost on top of the scope. I think all the cats are hungry. It does not say it found an SD card, but I also probably should have been looking at the text output. Oops. The scope output looks nice though. Okay. Let's reboot this and See if we see both the stuff we expect on the scope and in the terminal. So off, then trigger the scope. Oh, we got a bunch of reads. That's great. So not enough for it to successfully start up, but that's fine. We didn't really give this a real file system. Um, well, we kind of did. It has files in it, but it didn't like some aspect of this. Uh, but yeah, no, at this point it would actually be great 
to A, solder down this resistor, and B, have a better way of debugging what the actual block reads were. Like, like what if we had a trace buffer? So every time we got a read, we could write out a copy of what happened into the, because like we have eight megs of RAM, right? We have eight megs of RAM. We could just trace everything that happened and then dump it out after it's all done. And that might be really nice. Well, okay. So I've learned at least one thing that at least with this device, I need to pull up resistor. Um, but otherwise it looks like this is promising. I think Kay Temkin was saying that this device uses the four lane, like the four bit at a time SD mode. Maybe I'm remembering wrong, but we haven't actually, I haven't actually seen it get that far yet. Um, and it is interesting that we have the exact same need for a pull-up resistor with and without the FPGA. It's just a matter of the extra wire causing the signal to stay low or to go low a little bit faster. That's weird because I would think more capacitance would help. I don't know what that is. Anyway, the cats seem to want to hang out and I think I have streamed enough for the moment. So maybe it's a good time to wrap this up. I know this wasn't quite, uh, this wasn't quite as direct as some of the streams, but I hope it was enjoyable anyway, kind of trying out various things related to this SD card emulator and collecting ideas for the next step on this project. Um, in case anyone wasn't here for the intro, there wasn't really any direction to this especially much. I was taking a project that I did a little earlier, which is an SD card emulator, which at the time I was using it to do side channel analysis on some firmware by checking how long it took to read the directory entries. Um, and so one possibility is that I just kind of take it as is and make a video about it. Um, another possibility is that uh, I take, so the, the reason for the work originally was to try to do, it was like one of several things I was trying to do to an analyze some unknown firmware in a uh, industrial programmable logic controller. This was for a previous uh, a previous day job. And that was, like we got to the point where we kind of figured out a little bit about what it was looking for. Like we got a file name, but didn't know the contents and then kind of shelved that and worked on other aspects of it. Uh, but the actual emulator can do a lot, other, a lot of other things and it might be nice to actually do a video based on it. So there's that. And then it also seemed like maybe this could tie into some example or demo content for an upcoming keynote talk where it isn't really about this kind of hacking necessarily or like not about like a single hack, but it is about this kind of hacking in a slightly larger sense. And this might be a nice example to include in there. So um, yeah, so we have a bunch of things to try. It looks like this would be a really fun project to continue with a little bit more debugging. And it seems like it might just be good to throw some surface mount resistors on this breakout board. So maybe that's something we can do next time we're working on this and want to fuss with the microscope. Well, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you want more stuff like this, I've got some more stuff like this in the archives. If you go back a ways, but more like earlier this calendar year and like a lot of last year, I was working on more of this kind of stuff. Um, and I'll definitely be doing more in the future. And then there's also all the recent history where I've been doing uh, kind of robotics related stuff with the winch bot. All right, well, and thanks so much for everyone who tunes in. Uh, special thanks to all the new faces who've uh, been in after seeing, seeing the stuff on Hackaday and Reddit. And a super special thanks to everyone who's uh, committed enough to donate even just a dollar a month helps out so much in keeping the streams going and uh, keeping the time and the shop rent allocated toward this end. Um, oh, and about the archive, since James was just mentioning it, YouTube takes a few hours to get the archives up, but if you're jonesing for the archive right away, you can always get that on Twitch. If you go to twitch.tv slash scanlime, the archives there are immediate, which is kind of handy. And I'm gonna go fuss with cats and say hi to my friend, but I will see all of you later. And until then, happy hacking. Look at that command 17. It's just so happy. No getting stuck on command zero. All the way up to 17. I think that's block read.